<laughs> Ten year olds, everyone. You live with them. And you live with them. This is This Week in Science. We are going to do our live broadcast of our weekly podcast right about now. Are we all ready? Is everything there in the chat room? Can you see us on your video screens? Are we five by five? Do you hear us? <laughs> I see notes from Identity 4 that we're live. There's Kevin Unique. Hello, everyone. There you are. Live, live, live. Good. We're live. All that you see and hear tonight on this episode of This Week in Science may or may not make it to the final episode that is released as a podcast because I don't know what people are going to say. So you get to watch it all right now because we are starting this show in. Oh, wait. Do I have three things? I didn't write. Oh, no, I don't have three things. Blair, why didn't I write down three things? What is wrong? I don't know. I don't. What are you know. mumbling about? I need. I don't understand what's happening right now. For my intro, three things we've got: uh, honey tarantulas and a bit of light. How's that? Yeah, yeah. I put something in the in our private chat. Oh, you did. Okay, <laughs> checking it. Good private chat. See, this is what happens. This. And beetle pee. Thank you very much. Got it. All right. This is the uh, part of the show that I should have done before the show. This is not going to be in the show. Oh, yes. ID4 wants everyone to talk. Check. One, two. Check, check, check. Check, The check, arsonist check. had oddly shaped feet. Check, check, check. <laughs> Justin, say some words. <laughs> Blair is making me laugh too much to say anything. The human torch was denied a bank loan. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now I think it's time to start the show. Whoa. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Everybody sounding good? Check, check. Identity four is okay. We made it through that far. Yeah, Hot Rod. Check, check. Say something too, Hot Rod. We are beginning the show. I'm quiet again. Always quiet. Okay, turning it up just a little bit. Starting the show in a three, a two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 821, recorded on Wednesday, April 21st. 2021, Putting Science in the Light. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with tarantulas, beetle pee, and a bit of light. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Nothing is in the way of the world doing all the right things to prevent climate emergency from taking over. That looming, dooming, glooming over our planetary future like a dark foreshadowing cloud of something dystopian, ready to burst with thunderous metaphors, the sort of mechanisms uh, used in literature to alert readers of the dangers to come. That the story, in this case, isn't fiction, is a little bit of a problem. Instead of literary props that hint at the action ahead, we have scientific papers that spell out the threats, the causes, the solutions, consequences, and outcomes in great detail. If you watch the news these days, you won't hear anything about it. That's because there's no story arc. There's no reveal. There's no ratings appeal. It's just spoiler alert after spoiler alert. Like a whodunit where the real killer is revealed on the first page. A mystery twist movie where the big secret is revealed in the trailer and the title gives away the inevitable end. And so, with nothing left to the imagination, nothing left to interest or entertain, the public simply switches the channel, tunes out the emergency warnings, or they might do, uh, or they might do that if the emergency warnings were ever aired in the first place. But they aren't. You won't see it covered anywhere. While we seem to be saving the end of the world for some sort of late-century news cycle, we here will continue to bring you the boring news about the planet you are on, the universe you are in, and the uneventful discoveries about how everything works. Here on this week in science, coming up next. I've got the kind 
mind of mine that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about discovery, curiosity, findings, lots of findings, things of interest to our brains. And we do hope that you enjoy the hour plus that we have in store for you today. What did we bring to the show? Well, I have some stories about... What did I bring? I've got new stories about chimeras, honey, T-Rexes, who are kind of slow, and we have an interview tonight with Greg Gaber. Yes, looking forward to that. I'll be introducing him in a bit. Hello. Justin, yeah, what did you bring to the show, Justin? Justin? Uh, I've got why humans aren't all bad, traveling tarantulas, and is shift work really bad for you? Spoiler, yes, it is. (laughs) Spoiler, we've talked about this before. Blair, what is in the animal corner? Ayo, I have coffee, dogs, beetle pee, snake venom. Bam. (laughs) Bam! Choom, choom, choom. Well, we are going to get those stories out there for you all. But before we jump into the science, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us at twist.org. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and every podcast platform that's out there. Look for This Week in Science. Twist. All right, everyone, let's dive in to some fun chimeras. I would be missing a step if we if we didn't talk about monkey human chimeras today. I know that we talked about them a little bit over the weekend in our special crossover show with DTNS, which is was loads of fun. Yeah, that was and that awesome. yeah, and that podcast episode is going to be released to patrons only so if you're not a patron like that's a place where you can listen to the podcast episode however chimeras when you think of chimeras maybe it takes you to mythology and the idea of these beasts that are you know half lion half man half bull you know a variety of animals that are a mixed griffith? up together is that a thing a griffin a griffin a griffin? something along this line gri- yes is it one of those type of Exactly. Creatures. Um, um, an amalgam of creatures that work together as a creature with the abilities of these various creatures that somehow makes them stronger. All right. So here is the bottom line for research, scientific research that is looking into putting human cells with the cells of other species. The idea is that we could one day be able to produce organs for human transplantation that would be uh, acceptable to the human body, not rejected by the human body as as uh, transplants from other species are now. We have to use lots of anti-rejection drugs. And that we could we could have a source for organs for people. And we really need a source for organs for transplantation. That is a dire need for the health of humanity. So we're working on this. So far, human pig chimeras haven't worked out really well. About one in 100,000 pig cells is human when we try and put human cells into pigs. It doesn't work out very well. And so we've tried it now. A group in China went through a lot of review, a lot of ethical review, bioethicists taking a look at the study to see how they were going to produce it in China. Um, there's another researcher from the United States who was involved in this, Ispazua uh, Belmonte, and he uh, he worked with this team in China to achieve this goal of a human-monkey hybrid. Now, this is not a full-grown animal. This is 
a clump of cells. It's a blastocyst that was allowed to exist for less than 20 days. Not allowed to come to term. This is a ball of cells. There is nothing to this. It's not even an animal. And but so that's they, also so far, isn't it? Like, so I mean, far. And at this like, point, they don't, have, they don't have a plan at this point to allow anything to move past the ball of cells stage. At this point, it is looking to see if they can do it and what happens. Some pretty neat stuff, though. They can actually see this combination of uh, human and and uh, monkey cells as the chimera, this embryonic ball of cells, mm -hmm. grows. And they have a video, which is just amazing uh, to be able to watch. I'm going to see if I can find it right now and bring it up for everyone to take a look at. But they've got a video. They marked all of the human cells with a red fluorescing protein. And in that way, they were able to... Uh, track the cells to be able to watch them as they uh, as they integrated into the blastocyst to see how they integrated in the process of the blastocyst growing they discovered that the human cells didn't really like to hang out with the monkey cells and they were like i'm gonna be over here you go do your own thing. And the the human cells that did actually make it inside this embryo were they they kind of hung out with their own kind of cells and so there are obviously some issues with integration that the researchers don't understand yet and to that issue on top of it there were a number of places within the this human monkey embryo in which the human cells just didn't take at all and so this is not exactly a successful experiment in terms of the end goal of creating a human monkey hybrid that can create organs. This was not successful, but it did give information and that aspect of it was successful. You know what this yeah. reminds me of is cat chimeras, which are, are completely different, of course, but you're, yeah. you're telling me about how um, the, the human genes and the monkey genes kind of stayed apart from each other, but that's yeah. it. The, not the genes, but the tissue. Or the, yeah, yeah the, the tissue. The, the little cells in the ball of cells were like, I'm going right. to be, this is the human area and the monkey ones are going to be over here. Right. And so with, with cat, when cats, when there are two embryos that fuse, they end up with this very stark difference uh, in their, oh, in the way that they look. And so um, yeah. it, it could be similar that as it's developing, these two genomes are like, it, I'm different. So, Keep me apart. <laughs> so I would, I would, I would, I would take it away from the genome aspect of it, though. Uh, and 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 the reason why is because the the genome is more ingredients, sort of, right? Okay, and you get then the tissue that forms based on this. And what's interesting is that the tissues themselves have a level of communication to each other uh, that genes don't talk like this. But tissues do. Tissues are in communication. Tissues are relying on their neighbor and the signaling from their neighbor and how that neighbor is signaling. So it's, it's sort of interesting that uh, even, even when you get the, these genes combobulated together where you're trying to create the hybrid activity, when it gets to the tissue level, they don't speak the same language. That yeah, to me is sort a, of fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> and the, another aspect to this is that they looked at the, uh, the, the transcription factors, the proteins that were being, the genes that were being transcribed and what was getting turned on in the process. And they found that in the human monkey hybrid cells, uh, in those, those areas, these, these balls of cells did not did not differentiate and didn't develop at the same rate as either a only human or only monkey blastocyst would be developing. It slowed down the development by putting them together. And so there is miscommunication. There are they found there were different pathways turned on. There were um, unexpected proteins and genes to be activated. Um, so there is a lot to be learned here. Um, and there maybe looking at potentially which pathways do get turned on and how those could be important for uh, for the uh, moving forward in this technology. 
And Blair, I see uh, the mosaic cats, these yes. chimeras. Yeah, where it's those are just are they from that mirror universe? Isn't there a Star Trek episode yeah. where that cat? Mm -hmm. But I'm universe. black on this side and white on this side, and you're ah oh, yeah. Well, you're from the other other universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, anyway, there is a whole lot of work that still needs to be done for human-monkey hybrids. This is not a portent of the ape man to come in the future. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of issues <laughs> that still need to yeah. be worked on. Um, and it does sound as though they are really doing their best from a scientific perspective to take ethical uh, moral issues into consideration in the work that's being done. Well, that that said, good. it was done in China because no other countries would allow it to be done. <laughs> that, but you, you also have to understand what the the first and second uh, choice options were. Uh, the first option was just harvest organs from poorer humans in third world countries. That was option number one. That's where yeah, we were no. headed. No, that's not yeah, good. That was yeah. the first option. And so people were like, eh, is, what really? if we clone ourselves and then harvest the organs? And then they realize, oh, well, there's, we're going to clone humans and then steal their organs. That's almost as bad as the first one. If not, the, you know, and then the third option was like, oh, we'll make like an animal analog hybrid that we can harvest the organs from. People were like, OK, yeah, that's not nearly as horrible as the first two options. Yeah, so. and I, I think that's a really this is this brings up a really good point, and perhaps a future conversation for future that crossover Justin, episodes. That Justin watches too much dystopian sci-fi. Oh, yes. Maybe uh, that's no, the issue. No, but just that if you're if you're gonna do the preliminary testing to see if this is possible and viable, that means at some point you want to grow a full chimera. Mm -hmm. So the ethics conversations have to start now. Because yeah. it's going to take a long time to figure out the the kind of rules of engagement for this future realm of study. Yep. Right, and if you think I'm talking about dystopian future, Google India kidney black market. Just yeah. I think I don't want that in my search thing. history. It's already <laughs> a thing that's been going on. It's not. Okay. It's not a distant future scary thing it's a now yesterday and for decades actually thing oh okay but so so you're saying that and that makes me go huh hmm, humans are bad okay uh yeah. but justin can you tell me how we're not so bad well they're not we're, well we well <laughs> so <laughs> the invasive species that is currently destroying the world's air water soil disrupting fauna foliage selling each other's kidneys to each other Pretty much putting plastic into every earthly orifice isn't all bad, or at least wasn't always all bad. Uh, human recklessness and resource harvesting is relatively recent. It's kind of a new thing. Uh, according to new research published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, human societies for the last 12,000 years have been reshaping the ecology across most of the Earth's land surfaces. Uh, we sort of tend to think of this as a new thing that we've gained control of everything on the planet. But according to them, actually, indigenous people have spanned the earth and have been farming and hunting and managing uh, the, the wildlife around them for more than 10,000 years. The difference seems to be a more modern approach uh, is where you got the sort of resource uh, uh the, uh, the clear, sort of clear cutting of every resource imaginable. But yeah, they look back over, over uh, 12,000 years, three quarters of the terrestrial nature was inhabited, used and shaped by people, says one of the researchers. Uh, areas untouched by people were almost as rare 12,000 years ago as they are today. So granted, there's a lot more of us, we're doing a lot more transformation. But there was an interesting statistic that I thought was uh, in here. This is uh, from uh, somebody from the Penobscot, can't pronounce it, Indian nation. Uh, notes that indigenous people currently exercise some level of management of about 5% of the world's lands, which is 
sort of a little off-putting if you understand how much it was just saying that the people had been managing the majority of the, the terrestrial areas on the planet. And now the indigenous people, those people who've been apparently managing that land for a while, are now only managing about 5% of the world's lands. But in that 5%, 80% of the world's biodiversity exists. So while indigenous people have been excluded from management, access and habitation of protected lands in places such as the US national parks, uh, the track record says, maybe we should let them have a larger voice in how things are operating. But yeah, humans, not always bad for the environment. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't There's... always been, and maybe we can relearn some of the lessons that we've forgotten or that we pushed away because yeah. we were so, so bent on. Well, and, and you know, here's the sort of interesting thing: like, land. If you combine it with the indigenous thing, then yeah. it makes sense. It's a, it becomes very nimby all of a sudden, right? Like if you are, if you are living. In a beautiful forest, you're not, hey, you know how we can make money? Let's level our home. <laughs> Let's knock it down. You know, I bet that, I, you know, if, you, I bet if you're in a really nice big uh, house, you don't go, you know what? I bet there's, a, there's plenty of copper in these walls. With all the wiring and the lighting we got, we rip out all the copper. We could cash in on it. Nobody does that because they want to live in their home. And so I think that the point of the, that story also is that if you live... Uh, where those resources are. They're not just resources to exploit. They're part of your home. They're part of the infrastructure of your home. And that's, I think that's what, uh, that's what happens when, when people have power over land in which they do not inhabit. Is hmm. They can see it separate uh, from, from being home or habitat. Yeah, that it's, that it's then a combination of the two. 12,000 years of history, huh? We can get, we can get yeah. back there. We can do it. But Blair, maybe I'm forgetting things a bit. Is there maybe some coffee you could help me remember? You want to talk about coffee? I love coffee. We should talk about coffee. I need coffee. We should talk about day. coffee right now. Okay. Yeah. 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 Coffee no, I have not had any. I can't speed up. I know. You think coffee is really, it, it's impacted by climate change because coffee, of those tropical plant, it's, uh, it's really temperature sensitive. So you can't get too hot or the coffee, you'll lose all the coffee. And then what will you do in the morning? So <laughs> just cry. Anyway. <laughs> I was actually heartened by this recent study uh, where they actually, there, it was less of a study, more of a discovery. They discovered a type of coffee bean that was thought to be gone. And uh, I didn't know this. There are over a hundred known coffee species. I guess I just really hadn't looked into it. We get, the world gets all of our caffeine from just two uh arabica which is the superior brew that's usually what you're drinking and robusta which is usually used for instant coffee mm. so that's why instant coffee is so gross it's a different bean this is what i've learned <laughs> and it's wait it's, a it's, sec wait a sec it, i use it's a, it's an acquired taste it's bad and even <laughs> these coffee researchers say it's bad it's gross so the 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 issue here is that in the multi-billion dollar coffee industry, over a hundred million farmers are earning a living doing coffee. And so um, the problem is that Arabica is from the highlands of Ethiopia and South Sudan. It's a cool tropical plant. Its average annual temperatures are around 19 degrees Celsius. And um, it is really sensitive to temperature change. Any change past that 19 and it starts to not do so well. But Robusta actually is more robust, you might say, and can endure up to 23 degrees Celsius. So this, this other coffee, Stenophylla, can tolerate conditions similar to Robusta, but it tastes good too. <laughs> Ooh. So here's the thing, it's, it's more resilient and it has good taste. Um, now, they, they thought it was gone in about 1980. 1954, um, it completely disappeared, stenophylla from the from from studies, from records, and so um, it, it 
it didn't get used because they they thought it was gone forever. But they found it growing wild in Sierra Leone in 2018. And then they started testing its temperature tolerance and its flavor. They did blind taste tests. They found that this coffee was good. And they do think that it could become commercially available, but it would take some years because they found this vulnerable plant. It's, it's listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. And um, so they would have to cultivate this, kind of tame it to be farmed a little bit, find the right place to, to grow it, create an industry for it. But they think in some short years, this thing could pop up in your coffee cup in the morning and it might be a lot more resilient to climate change. That's Boy, what I was wondering. they should have kept wondering. it a secret. Yeah. Because now you got the, you're going to have the, you know what's going to happen. These sort of barista uh, coffee snobs are like, ah, I've got to get that, help my hands on that bean. I got to just try a cup. And they all try a cup and then it's all gone. And nobody can have any. because no, this is the beauty. You're, th that actually puts money into the farming of it and make, creates more Might make it more available. Which actually makes it more available and the population yeah. more robust as well. So. Yeah, I love the idea because we've been talking so many times on the show about the plight, potential plight of coffee and chocolate, two very important mm. <laughs> compounds that we that we really mm -hmm. enjoy in our culture. Um, and if through climate change, it gets harder to be able to grow those beans in the places where they're known to be grown, you need a more robust plant. So sure why is this plant vulnerable if it is robust? This is... Um, so... <laughs> what happened more, to it? So it's more robust to climate change. That does not mm -hmm. mean that it's more robust to invasive species, poaching, right. all these other kind people. of, you know, habitat yeah. destruction that Justin was just talking Got it. about. So, yeah, so the, the it's still a rainforest species and it's right. still, therefore, um, in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All so right. we got to save it and cultivate it. Save the coffee. Save all the coffee. We need it. Uh. All right. I think we've got some more stories, but let's jump into our interview. I'm going to dive us forward a little bit in time to now. To now, everyone. You're watching This Week in Science and... If you like the show, please tell a friend. We'd love it if you helped spread the word. I would love to introduce our guest for the evening. Dr. Greg Burr is a professor in the Department of Physics and Optical Science at the University of North Calif Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he studies classical... Charlotte. Charlotte, sorry. I, I think I just typed, typed, did type, typed. <laughs> At the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where he studies classical optics and the wave nature of light. He's also the author of Falling Felines and Fundamental Physics, which I fully approve of. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gabur. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. I've just been enjoying listening to your uh, early discussion. Yeah, we enjoy talking about all the things and... Your visit to the show t tonight came about because of something we were talking about on the show last week related to laser beams and scattering light and the possibility of light making its way through objects, through opaque surfaces, which is a fascinating idea. And someone shared a post of that with you. And you're like, wait, what? You could talk to me. And so we're talking yeah. to you now. I'd love to get your comments on this story. But I'm also so excited to get to talk with you on the show because you were on my old show, Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, years ago when I was not on my show because right. I was in maternity leave. Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> yep, I remember that. I, I didn't know if you'd remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you had a wonderful conversation with Brian Mallow yep. and... I wasn't there and I was sad. And now I get to talk with you, so I'm very excited. And we all get to talk with you, so it's a gift to everyone. <laughs> Yay! So welcome. And just to start off, we're not going to dive right into that story because I want to bring people into who you are and what you sure. do and and how we can how how you can help us understand what we were talking about last week. How did you get interested in 
optical physics in light? Like why the waviness of light particles as opposed to the particle aspect of light particles? Um, well, part of it is my history as a confused graduate student. Um, I originally went to graduate school to do high energy physics because I thought I wanted to study the, you know, the secrets, the fundamental secrets of the universe. I still do technically, but there, there's plenty more to study. And so I was doing a lot of work on experimental high energy physics, but started to feel like it wasn't for me. Um, I wrote a blog post about this years ago. There were like a handful of reasons. It wasn't like there was one particular reason. It's a great field, but there was just like a bunch of little stuff that made me think maybe I don't want to do this with my whole life. And, um, a friend of mine was working for Professor Emil Wolf, who is one of the was one of the big names in optical science and theoretical optical science. And my friend said, "Hey, why don't you uh, go talk to him?" And so I talked to Professor Wolf, and he dumped this pile of papers on my de on my lap that he had written over the past three or four years. And I really I really fell in love with the elegance of the wave nature of light. Um, the mathematics of the wave nature, if you look at pictures of waves, everything looks really beautiful and sort of elegant and smooth. And that's really how the mathematics feels too. It really makes sense when you look at all the pieces, they fit together perfectly. The quantum nature of light, the idea of light as this quantum particle, we're still actually trying to figure that out. I don't think anybody really completely understands how to we can we can predict experiments great we can do experiments great but trying to understand what it all means is still kind of a big question mark um so i love the elegant mathematics which is what drew me in and i'm still trying to personally figure out all that quantum stuff <laughs> this could be some deep deep quantum soul searching yep. on the personal side yeah so what is it about optical physics that you work in that just you you find really interesting like what is this like what is what just drives you to, what do you want to figure out well a lot of what i like to do now is the way i describe optics these days is if you look at the history of optics over the past literally thousand years it was all about understanding what light can do like okay light can light can go through this small hole it can't do that and just sort of setting down the rules over the past kind of 20 years or so the story has changed and people have realized that a lot of these rules we take for grant have taken for granted aren't really rigorous rules and they can be bent and so the story has become more instead of how what is what can light do the story has become how can we make light do whatever we want it to do <laughs> Yeah, and what can't light do? <laughs> yeah, and, and so that's a lot of what what appeals to me is seeing all these different ways we can break the rules. I mentioned like imaging, the wave nature of light means that there's all, that when an object is too small, you can't really see it anymore or get a picture of it with ordinary light. Um, but people have figured out that by doing the, a variety of different tricks, you can see things smaller than the conventional wisdom would tell you you could get away with and it's really fun to play with it's it's both the fundamental part and the practical part because you're trying to get around fund seemingly fundamental rules but then you can actually do something with it in the end if that makes some sense yeah so when i think of imaging you know it's a lot of light reflect bouncing off of stuff and then we are really taking we are recording or or viewing that reflected light right um and so when with x-rays it's a bit different that's just more energetic light when you start thinking about it but how do you break down like the various wavelengths and what they can do and what they can't do how do you start looking at that um well, the different wavelengths, it's really, in the end, it all comes down with how, to how they interact with matter. Um, mm -hmm. That's what makes the difference. So yeah, X-rays are really high energy, high energy photons, we would say, light particles, and they just barrel through stuff. Some of them get absorbed. That's what allows us to take X-ray photos. 
And it makes the math really simple because you just shine x-rays in one side and on the other side, you just measure how many got through and you know they all came through in a straight line. You can figure out, you can deduce kind of roughly what they went through. Um, at other wavelengths, different things happen. Um, if you're looking at infrared light, that tends to be connected to, that tends to excite thermal vibrations in, in molecules and atoms. So that's what makes things heat up. Um, and ultraviolet light tends to kick electrons off of items, which is part of why it causes cancer and, and does a lot of chemical reactions. So Breaking it down, the yeah, the behavior of the light is really comes from our matter-based perspective that we're always looking at how these different wa these different wavelengths interact with matter. And that gets at so an area that you're interested in, which is the inverse problem. And that is look looking. Can you explain the inverse problem? Because I know if I try to explain it, I'm going to completely <laughs> hack it to bits. And so. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm actually trying to write an explanation that makes sense myself these days. Yeah. Um, so I think I've been thinking about it. Um, well, one way to think about it is most problems in physics are sort of a cause. A, they follow sort of a cause and effect scenario. So you say, here's an object. I know what this object is. I hit it with a hammer. I want to predict what happens. I'm going to use the laws of physics to figure out what the, the effect is. Uh, if, if I use a hammer as my cause to whack an object, I can use the laws of physics to figure out what the effect is on the object. The inverse problem is going the other way around, saying suppose, suppose I measured what happened to this object that I smashed. Can I now go back and figure out either what the object was in the first place, or can I and deduce what the cause was, what I hit it with? I often describe it like a crime scene investigation, that at a crime scene you show up, you want to know who did it, and you want to know what was done. You've got a certain amount of information. You're trying to backtrack and figure out who did it, what the cause was of the phenomenon. So an inverse problem is reversing the cause and effect rules that we usually use in physics. We go from an effect to a cause. Isn't this how we talk about the Big Bang? To some extent, yeah. I mean, in a sense, in a sense, that's very much a sort of inverse problem that we've got the existing universe at as it is. We kind of know the laws of physics, so we're kind of backtracking and trying to figure out where it all came from. And um, we talked about X-ray imaging. That's another example of an inverse problem. Or CAT scans you can get. You take a lot of measurements. You don't know what the object is you're imaging. You measure what happens to the X-rays. And then from knowledge of what happened to the x-rays, you try and figure out what the object is. And so when we're coming from a matter-based perspective, is there any is there anything that we are aware of that might be there, but we're not perceiving it because we don't know how to measure to get the cause? <laughs> um, well, um, to, to like, some extent... Like invisible objects that are yes. there, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not. Yeah, there. That's that happens to be an area that I study is sort of invisibility theory, and um, I don't know that there's anything there we're not seeing. But this is actually a a, a problem for uh, in inverse problems. This is why there's a whole mathematical field called inverse problems because pretty much any time you're using your eyes, you're also doing an inverse problem. You look at something, your eyes detect the light you deduce what that object is you're looking at. But those are really simple problems that you don't have to worry too much about hidden things. Though there are tons of optical illusions that show that there are a lot of problems with the way our eyes detect things. Yeah. But you start doing like computed tomography where you take a bunch of X-ray images of a person from different angles, you take all that data and you mix it up in a computer and get out an image. And now you run into the question, okay, I did all this math, but how do I know that I'm actually seeing everything that's there? And this ends up being a something that's not talked about a whole lot, but there's this intimate connection between invisibility and inverse problems. Because in the context of a particular problem, if an invisible object exists, 
if invisible objects in principle exist, then you can't solve the inverse problem because whatever you measure, there's always the possibility that you're missing something. And I use the crime scene investigation argument for that too, because there is the, pro the risk when you're studying a crime scene that there just isn't enough information present at the crime scene to solve the problem. And yeah. that's also where invisibility and inverse problems come together is you really worry about when you're studying a new type of inverse problem, whether you can, whether there's enough information there to figure out what you're trying to look at. And so is that just a matter of us needing to catch up with the, the unknowns that might still be there? It's sort of, I'm picturing this crime scene happening a really long time ago where <laughs> this, this, this crushed body is found at the bottom of a, of a, of a, of a cliff base. And, and, but they haven't figured out gravity yet. So they're like, something big must have stayed. That's the only solution because they're very squished. But uh... <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, one thing uh, to use a technical term, all the technical terms in physics are often very boring. Um, they use what's called prior knowledge because sometimes you don't have enough information on the scene to figure out what happened, but there's extra information you could bring into the picture that helps. So in your case, you find this guy lying crushed on the ground. You say, well, I can't tell if he fell off from a big height or he got stepped on. And then you look over there and there's a big cliff. You go, okay, now That's I can good. use that information. All right, yes. that helps me. Context. Yes. Yeah. It, it, and it's so that's a big trick in a lot of these sort of imaging problems is taking advantage of information you already have. Like in medical imaging, um, we know that the patient that we're imaging is roughly human sized. So even the size of the person is an important piece of information. We know we're not imaging somebody the size of a house. So when you get that data, you have some context. If you get a solution that says this person is the size of an elephant, you know that's not the right solution. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's good to have those limitations on you that set that set the boundaries that can contain the information that you'll find that you're going yeah. that will be relevant to what you're looking for. So from the invisibility standpoint, how close are we to invisibility cloaks? And <laughs> I mean, is Harry Potter around the corner or is this no. like going to be like, you know, super secret CIA tech? Um, this is one of those dangerous questions to answer because I'm on, I'm on camera being recorded about it. I know. Um, <laughs> and so it's fair. I, I could, I could give my, my conservative estimate is any time from tomorrow to a hundred years to, from now to never. Um, <laughs> That's but, a super meaningful answer. Range. Thanks. No. <laughs> well, let, uh, to give a little so, context. So not in the past. No, it definitely, okay. definitely well, not well, in the that, past. Uh, that narrows it down quite a bit. There's a lot of past. Yeah. That's billions of years we've ruled so, out right there. Yeah. To, to give a little context. So in 2006, the first papers came out about the theoretical possibility of invisibility cloaks. And I had done mm -hmm. my PhD work on some invisibility stuff. So national newspapers contacted me and said, what do you think about this? And they naturally asked me, when do you think something will happen? And I was like, well, you know, you say five years and nobody's going to remember what you say in five years. Yeah. Um, well, it turned out it was more like four months that oh. um, they only made, they made a flat invisibility cloak. So it was just a small thing. They were sending waves through this small slab and it was designed for microwaves and it was not perfect, but they surprised me by already knowing how to demonstrate the principles. Mm. Um, but to give a better answer to your question, um, it's kind of hard to, it still is kind of hard to say. There are a lot of really amazing advances that keep happening. Um, so one big problem with invisibility cloaks is that, so th the idea of an invisibility cloak is the light comes in, it goes around some hidden region and goes on the way it was. But the, the catch is, is that the amount of time it takes for the light to take that detour has to be the same amount of time it takes for light to go on the outside of the cloak. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you could detect that time difference and you could see that something was there. Um, well, that means, but that means that the light going through that cloak 
is probably going to have to go faster than the vacuum speed of light. And we know that it can't do that. Or, well, it starts to get technical, but it can kind of do that for like one frequency of light or one wavelength or a very small range of wavelengths. But so you can make you can make an invisibility cloak that would work for a really particular shade of red, <laughs> um, which may be useful. But um, so that's been a limitation. But last year, um, somebody else I was I was talking to another podcast person about invisibility stuff, and they're like, "Oh, did you see this paper?" And I was like, "What paper?" And um, and some researchers kind of found a clever way to partially get around that limitation of this will only work for one color. So the biggest problem is still materials. Um, hmm. in, order to, in order to make an invisibility cloak that guides light that way, you need to make a device. You have to be able to control the structure of matter on a, in three-dimensional space. You have to make a three-dimensional object and kind of be able to control this, the structure of the matter almost on the atomic level. <laughs> and we this doesn't sound like something that you'll be able to just well, throw over your like... head and walk no. around with this, <laughs> this is like... also sounds like the hard way to do it why, yeah. why isn't it just you know uh cameras on one side uh wearable screen on the other why Actually, isn't that just like, like the shortcut version uh that that's a very astute question because that has been done um and in 2003, there was a Japanese research group that they did. They made a retroreflective coat, and they had a projector on the front and a camera in the back, so the person looks completely see-through. And it's, it's a really eerie image of them just sort of standing there with their face not visible, sort of waving around like a ghost. Um, what I thought was really cool, but they're not really invisible because you can still tell that they're there. But the really cool thing about this is what you can do with it. And that is, in their case, they're trying to design a, a transparent cockpit for an airplane or for the interior of a car mm -hmm. so that you're in your so car. You everywhere. Yeah, you could look. You could see if you're about to hit that car right to your left because you can literally see it. Or if you're flying an airplane, you'll know if there's a plane right below you because you just look down at your feet and you can see it. So... That's one of the things that fascinates me about invisibility research is it's not clear if we'll ever make a really practical cloak where somebody can walk around and they'll never be seen. Yep, exactly. There but um, there is the possibility that this sort of technology of making things at least virtually see-through will have a lot of advantages. I, I guess if you try, if I, I can, I can imagine the advantages for entertainment. I can imagine advantages. I'm, I'm sure there are political or, uh, you know, mostly I'm, I'm going in the media direction, but maybe that's <laughs> because I spend a lot of time in the media. But from the other perspective of how things like this work, I mean, you have light n not really going through things, but this is what that paper was about last week, creating Wait a sec. Not a really light. going through things? Wait, I thought it was going through things. Ah! <laughs> You're ruining it. I, I know. It was... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just difficult. Yeah. So last week, the story was about a class of materials, class of light called scattering invariant light that the researchers showed they could get to pass through a zinc oxide coating, a zinc oxide "Quote unquote object." Um, what do you think about this this work? Oh, it's um, it's actually really cool. And part of the reason that I was like complaining on Twitter, like you should have me on, you should have me on, is because I'm familiar with the earlier work of these researchers. They've been doing similar work since like about 2007. And the idea is, is that yeah, you've got you've got some sort of material. It's strongly scattering, but not absorbing. So the light doesn't get like sucked up by the material. It just bounces around in it like a ball in a pinball machine. And so any light that comes out the other side is basically randomized by the time it comes out. This is 
this is the difference between like a transparent object and a translucent object. If you have a translucent piece of glass, the light's definitely coming through, but you have no idea what's on the other side of it. Image. Yeah. yeah, you don't get any image through. Um, but these researchers have been developing this idea that if you structure the light in an, if you pre-structure the light in just the right way, you can start transmitting images through it. And yeah, it, it's off the, if you, if for a general, for a general take, it's just a really cool approach. And it again, fits that idea I was saying before of optics is nowadays about doing things we didn't think were possible before. Like if you go back 20 or 30 years, nobody would have said, Hey, we can get light through this sort of opaque scattering material. And these folks have shown that by this new technique that, yeah, we, they can probably even send images through. How, how does this happen? What is this? What, I mean, so scattering as a random chaotic process versus scattering at, as, as they're calling it invariant. So obviously there's going to be predictability about yeah. how the light is going to move through the 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 surface is this at are they predicting this at atomic scale no um from from what i understand looking at the paper they really took a particular material they they basically just measured the they they sent a bunch of light beams through it to get some idea of how light transfers through the material they don't care about the structure of the material they only mm -hmm. care about how light gets through it. So, you know, you send a beam in the upper left corner and you see it comes, some of it comes out in the lower right, and then you send it in the upper right and it comes out the lower left, something like that. And you put together this, this, this table, basically like a list of saying, if I put light in here, it comes out here. And along the way, they figured out that they could make the so-called invariant modes. And the idea of an invariant mode is they were able to mathematically calculate that there's some, that some, if you, if you send a beam of light into the material with just the right patterning, it will go through the material as if it had just gone through air. And yeah, it, that I is wacky. That yeah. Just, so, it, so, <laughs> okay. So, so basically, they the mo they model the beam specific to the composition of the material while looking at the backside to sort of get the image in focus. So they're cheating. Yeah. If they move this like uh, an inch over in the same material, it might not work if the composition is a little different. Yeah. If you you that. So yeah, I think. Though, if, it, if it's the same type of material, I think things will work out on average. But yeah, if you use like a different material or you, like they were using some sort of material deposited on a piece of glass, I think. If you deposited yeah. it in a different way so that the structure was different, Slightly then thicker. you'd have to restart. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but it, it's really, <laughs> whoops, sorry, go so ahead. It's not, it's, so we're not quite at the, because I was, I've invested so much money in X-ray glasses over the years. The back of the comic book. Every I was hoping every year there'd be like a new edition because the old ones didn't seem to really do the trick. But we're still not, we're still not there yet. No. Um, okay. Yeah, this is. Um, well, it's kind of like invisibility. I keep telling people, I'm like, it's really, really cool, and it helps us understand a lot about light. But we're not at a point where you have to. We're nowhere near a point where you have to worry about your personal privacy. Right. You don't have to worry about the invisible person sneaking into your house. And yep. we don't yet have to worry about the the laser beam imaging system that's going to see through the walls of our house. No. Co it's, cover it's, your yeah. webcams. Yeah. <laughs> Still, Make cover your, your webcams. I think that's the... <laughs> it's your, it's your little that's covers, the but other than that, you're fine. Exactly. So at the... At the the nano scale, like when light is interacting with 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 bits of atoms, right? Uh, when light is interacting at this this nano scale, can you predict what's going to happen? Um. Yes. Um, well, yeah. If you have a material, 
that that's sort of the, the what we would call the forward problem or the the cause effect problem in physics if you know the structure of the material you can you can do the math we understand pretty well the how the interaction of light with matter um though there is a catch because um when you get beyond the light interacting with a small well how do i put this you could it's very easy to do the study how light scatters off of a really small object and it's really easy to figure out how light scatters off of a really big object um, when it's an object that's somewhere in between then things get really tricky <laughs> and then we know in principle how to solve that problem but in practice we don't have a lot of good tools to do it um, and this also goes back to kind of the computed tomography the x-ray tomography stuff we know how to we know how to use visible light to with we know how to use x-rays to go through an object we know how light travel ex, sorry how x-rays travel through an object so we can we can work with that if you try and image the human body, the interior of the human body with visible light, now there's so much more scattering and the problem is so much more complicated. We still don't really have a good handle on that. Um, and as you can, as you've probably noticed, we are not transparent. So the problem is quite difficult. Um, yeah. And even with, with cells, just cellular imaging, not even a living person, a body, a whole body, you have to usually kill the cell to in the process of imaging it that the process of it imaging itself destroys it in the act so it's there's this there are, yeah yeah there is getting inside of biological structures is hard yeah. <laughs> it by by coincidence uh, my my former phd advisor emil wolf he invented this technique called diffraction tomography which is sort of the it's it's like computed tomography with x-rays but it works with visible light and the light is scattering but it only works when you have really really small objects but it so turns out that for people who are interested in imaging cells and getting three-dimensional structural images of cells it's a great technique so even recently there have been a few papers that have come out where people said oh look we can take a living cell and we can we can actually get some three-dimensional structural information of this cell while it's just sitting there doing its thing. Amazing. Yeah, we need movies. I want movies of <laughs> that are not visualizations or, you know, I I want the real movie of the actin walking down the myosin. Right. You know, <laughs> we want those, the real thing. Yep. But, yeah. Um, so in... In our chat room, somebody uh, wants to know, uh, interesting, all this is very interesting, but how many cats does Greg have? Um, technically, I have five of my own, and my roommate has one, so there are six cats floating around at home. And are they actually floating? Have you... <laughs> managed yeah, <laughs> part of some sort of experiment you've been working on <laughs> no I, I, i've figured out that over the past 300 years there's been enough research on cats falling all over the place so uh no they're just pretty much sitting or they're, they're they're cats are mostly just laying around except when i'm trying to do an important zoom call and then they're pay attention to me yeah then they're yes. sticking their tails or whatever in my face <laughs> but in your book Falling felines and fundamental physics. You use you, you you took inspiration from your cats. Yeah. How did that? What were you just watching your cats and you're like, how do they always land on their feet? And now I am now I'm writing a physics book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I the the original the original thing that got me started on the book was my blogging because I love to read and write about the history of science and being a, re a really super big nerd i um i tend to get bored and late at night i'll just go browse old scientific journals so i'll say all right let me start in the year 1850 i'll pick a journal and just go look through and see what interesting scientific papers have been uh written and honestly i worry that even my scientific colleagues find me boring at times because before the pandemic, I was going to meetings like, let me tell you this little cool bit of trivia. And they're like, yeah, it's it's a bedtime, I think. <laughs> um, but 
so I found I found this paper from 1894, which was the first high speed photography of a cat flipping and landing on its feet. Oh, fantastic. And it, it turned out it caused quite a ruckus, um, uh, caused quite chaos in the scientific community for a while. But so the first thing I did is I wrote a blog post on that original paper. I'm like, oh, this is cool. It's history of science, physics and cats, three things that I love. And then I got curious. So I was like, is that the whole story? And so I kept doing literature searches and I just kept finding more and more papers of people studying how cats land on their feet in different fields of different scientific fields going from, yeah, 300 years ago up to the present day, people sort of scientists constantly wondering how cats do it. And at that point, I was originally talking with my publisher about writing a book on the history of invisibility physics. And I contacted him and said, yeah, I think I'm going to write a cat book first. And they were just sort of like, okay, whatever. Um, oh yes. Here's the, cause the cats are amazing. Yep. There's a, the quote in the original 1894 translated paper from nature says that, the expression on the cat's face in the photographs indicates a definite lack of interest in the science of it. Paraphrasing <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. It's it's so interesting too, because so so many animals, I can tell you from personal experience, do not land on their feet. Right, right. Um, yeah, if, if you. You can look up some very sad images of people uh, that people did back in the day of dropping dogs that are trying to land on their feet, and the dog is like paddling in the air, desperately oh. trying to turn over. And it's always done with a uh, with cushioning. And nowadays, I tell people there are enough videos online. Please don't drop your animals. Uh, just go look. You it don't up. need to do these experiments anymore. That's okay. We've done yeah. them. And. <laughs> Now that I've written this book, it's kind of amazing that I see this motion in other animals. Um, just last week, I somebody on Twitter shared an image of a mongoose fighting a cobra. And the cobra strikes at the mongoose, and the mongoose flips to its side. Its tail starts kind of doing a propeller. And I see it twist its body, and I look at that, and I go, it's doing exactly the same motion that a cat would do. <laughs> And so different animals have evolved the same sort of writing technique, but for different purposes. For cats, it's because they think they're cleverer than they are and they fall off of stuff a lot. For a mongoose, it's an ability to maneuver when it's hunting its prey. This is rascal, by the way. A new cat makes its way through. Yeah. They, they shall all make their, make their way through a procession of cats. During the yeah. podcast, I love I really, it. <laughs> I really suspect they know that they're on camera and they just want to make sure that everybody else knows that they're there. Well, either they know they're on camera or they know you're talking to no one and they're yeah. like, we need to check in on him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that too. It's like, I'm right here. <laughs> Talk to me. So what, in what interesting uh, findings did you have while you were researching your book? Um. Quite a, uh, quite a lot of surprises, um, one of which is that the earliest physics paper I found where somebody tried to explain how a cat lands on its feet is from the year 1700. And wow. so Isaac Newton was still alive um, when, when the first physicists tried to explain how this worked. They were wrong, but it was amazing to just find this. Um, the other thing that I love is that 1894 um, paper. So Etienne Jules Mary, the photographer, he was a physiologist. He really, he really just was dropping every animal. He was studying the motion of everything. And one of his colleagues said, why don't you drop a cat? So he dropped a cat. He took the photos. I don't think he expected much to come of it, but he took his photos to the French Academy of Sciences and the French Academy had a huge argument over it because they said, um, from what we understand of physics, what you've shown us is impossible. <laughs> and, oh, wow. 
and journalists had a field day. I had a friend translate for the book, a French journalist who was just mocking the scientists. They just, he was, this, this fellow was just clearly having a great time going, okay, here are the greatest minds in the world. And they're having this practical, almost a, you know, a bare knuckle boxing match over how a cat lands on its feet. And um, so that was just a delight to find that, um, it's an interesting story of how science works because people had only in the 1800, mid 1800s, people really understood that rotational motion has this sort of conservation law that if something twists to, you know, twists this way, something else has got to twist the other way to make up for it. It's what we call conservation of angular momentum. So, but in those early days, people hadn't thought about it too much. So they thought, well, if something's falling, if something's in free fall, it can't just turn over because that would it would just be spontaneously rotating, it would violate conservation of angular momentum. But Mary's photographs showed exactly that. They showed a cat being dropped, and then the cat's like, Oh, I'm in free fall, and it flips over. And so the French Academy was having this big argument about how this happened. To their credit, by the time they met again, like a week later, they'd all said, okay, I think I, under I think we figured it out. We're good. But it was a little embarrassing. It was a perfect example of the old adage that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. They, uh, they thought they understood this problem, but they hadn't really thought about it that much. And they were totally baffled when they were faced with the real world. <laughs> the uh, real was... world. It doesn't doesn't fit what my mind thinks. Yes. There, there was another version of this uh, that happened with horses running where all the artist depictions, if you look at the old, old paintings, when there is a point when horses have all of their feet off of the ground when they're running really fast and it's when they're outstretched. And you'll see this and all sorts of real, like gigantic, huge uh, works of art. This type that take up like the side of a house, kind of like big paintings showing horses doing this with it. And then there was this bet that took place where they had to do, uh, what was it? Uh, they, it was either Stanford or somebody, somebody made this bet. Leland, anyway, San yeah, Leland, Leland Stanford. Stanford. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and, and, and so he, I guess he won the bet. It was like a dollar bet or something, but it was, they had a high speed photographer go and take pictures of this horse running by. And it turns out there is a point when all of the horses hooves are off the ground but it's it's all tucked up underneath yeah it was sort of the opposite of the of what they had thought but yep. uh yep to, not not to sound too smug but i actually talk about that in my book as well oh nice because <laughs> uh, yeah that 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 whole idea of uh high speed photography was such a game changer for science like, and naturalism um yeah it just there were all these things that people took for granted and then they were shown how it really was and yeah and the artists were actually kind of offended because they had argued for that. years about the proper way to show a horse galloping and <laughs> well, it that just way would looks not better look too. Yeah. i know just imagining this grand painting with a horse tucked yeah. up underneath itself yeah. it's not not as expansive yes yeah. so <laughs> as, now, and now as i'm recalling i think it was mulridge who did the uh the photography for this but Leland's bet was that, yes, that there was a point when all the hooves were uh, 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 off the ground because he had an art collection with horses doing this, <laughs> this like, Superman move. And it turned out he was, somebody else argued that that never happens. And it turned out he was right. It was just not how he thought he was right. Well, I mean, it, it happens was... when they jump, but. <laughs> right. But in a, in a run, in a run. Yeah. It was, was in a, yeah. yeah. One... It's, it's, high speed photography is so. Yeah, I was just thinking about how many studies I have brought to this show that are dependent on high speed photography. And it's, you know, how do butterflies uh, move? How do dragonflies stop from falling? That was a really good one. That was a good one. Um, yeah. How do spiders jump? It, it's all based on this high speed photography. So then, if we get even faster, though, and we're trying to figure out how light is operating, isn't there a problem at some point? Because doesn't light kind of just ignore time at some point pretty much and just go, ah, you know, that's your, your photography can't like chop up. Can it keep up with it? Yeah. Um, point. In fact, 
um, I can say that there have been there has been research done experimental experiments have been done where people have been able to photograph the motion of light mm. and they use what they call they're what called a streak camera and the idea uh, i don't know if i how how i can explain this because it, it it sounded better when i wrote it in a page but so <laughs> they actually have these images of so they would they actually like had a light a beam of light they they flashed like a light bulb and their camera was fast enough that you can see the reflection of the light as it travels over a surface. Mm. So you're actually seeing the motion of light. And um, it's a bit cheating because in order to get a full image, they have to do like, basically a streak camera can only take a, a picture of a line of pixels. Because what it does is it separates out the image by... So it, it sort of keeps track of the time in the vertical direction and takes the picture in the horizontal. Um, and so in order to get like a two-dimensional movie of light moving, they had to do the same experiment over and over again and sort of wrap it. You're talking about the like inkjet ink printer, right? Practically, <laughs> yeah, practically like that. Perforated um, sides. <laughs> yeah, but um, so yeah, but it's it's so it's a really cool... And I don't think anybody knows what to do with it. It was sort of a proof of principle, like, hey, we can actually make a camera that goes fast enough to see light as it travels. Um, so while, while, again, one of those things that nobody would have thought would have been something you could actually do, and somebody managed to push the technology to get there. Nice. Now that we have the technology to get there, where can that technology take us? Because that's always like in science and technology, that seems to be it always these ideas build on each other. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it seems like if, if you have a camera that can go that fast, I imagine the next natural thing would be to see whether you could design it to measure things that are not light itself anymore, but try to measure reactions like, I don't know, atoms emitting light or absorbing light, try to try to get images of these sort of quantum level mm. effects that are usually too fast to keep track of. Um, this is just really off the top of my head because when I first saw that camera fast enough to watch light move, I was like, well, that's really cool, but I have no idea what you're going to do with that. <laughs> Sometimes proof, proof of concept is it's just like it's a gift in itself. Yeah. And <laughs> science for science sake. Yeah. And as I've learned, it's whenever you see something like that and you say, I have no idea what you're going to do with that, somebody's going to eventually find something to do with it. So <laughs> I'm not yeah. wise enough to predict it all. What do you want to do with the invisibility stuff that you're working on? My own invisibility stuff is partly to, partly I'm trying to really understand the physical limits right now is to say, to see whether we can understand how to make a perfect cloak that works for all colors of light. Um, so part of my research is really along those lines of seeing how we can improve the existing theoretical models to make something that works better. Um, also, another aspect of invisibility that really intrigues me is the idea of using it for protection instead of just hiding. Because the, so this idea of guiding waves around an object that should work for any type of wave. It doesn't, it's not restricted to light. So mm -hmm. people have actually proposed seismic invisibility cloaks. So I can stick something in the ground around a building, say, so that if there's an earthquake, it can guide some of the energy around the building and might make the difference between, it might make the difference between the building surviving or not. Um, yeah. And in that case, it doesn't have to be a perfect cloak it just has to do enough to improve the resistance of the building and there have been some seismic tests of this done in 2014 some folks took a pile drive they went out to uh to like a quarry they dug a bunch of holes in the ground to mimic 
the structure of an invisibility cloak. They used a pile driver on one end and hammered it down to create like shallow seismic waves and then measured what vibrations appeared on the other side. And we're able to say, yeah, we by putting this pattern of stuff in the ground, we we're able to partially block these minor seismic waves. And so partly my work is still very fundamental, but I always also have an eye towards, it would be really cool to see some of these invisibility and cloaking concepts go towards practical protection applications like that. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I was also thinking you could make pretty, uh, maybe pretty cool solar panels or uh, <laughs> where you could just, you know, just move all, you could do a whole surface or a wall with this. And then instead of having all the solar panel and you just move it all over to one solar panel that can handle a high intensity beam that's all of the other light of say one wall and one side of a building oh. down into a small space and just have that be the little collection device there. Uh, there's all sorts of things you could do if you could control that. Yeah, and this is sort of, broadly speaking, this is a lot of what um, people are doing with this idea. The whole idea of invisibility is connected to what people call metamaterials these days. The idea that you take you if you can control the structure of a material on a scale on the order of tens of atoms or hundreds of atoms, then you can create optical properties that you don't find in materials in nature, which we call metamaterials. And with metamaterials, people are doing all sorts of things like hey, we can make solar panels that collect more light than you would think they should be able to, or mm -hmm. make invisibility cloaks, or make make a lens, like a camera lens that's flat. You know, most of our cameras, we have multiple lenses, and you get this, if you have a really nice camera, you have a huge lens. And so part of the idea is, well, we can smash these lenses down and make a lens that works just as well, but it's just this thin sheet. And people have been trying to do that for years. I don't know if they've actually, how well they've succeeded or not, but that's sort of still ongoing stuff that people are interested in. Again, breaking the rules of the way, the way people, the way things are traditionally done and saying, we can just try and do that in a completely different way and ignore all the rules and see what happens. Yeah. And I love the, I love the, the application of things where it, it things are taken from one air arena and then are allowed to take different forms in in different arenas. So if you're talking about a lens that you can use to to collimate light, then you know maybe there's another kind of way that a lens like that could be used. A, a thin, lighter lens would be really useful on telescopes or on mm -hmm. uh, you know on on telescopes especially if you're going to be launching them into space, right? So Ooh. and speaking of space, yeah. Then, uh, then you got rad uh, radiation diversion devices for uh, uh, habitats oh. on Mars or on Earth. I mean, this is maybe this yeah. is what we need to do: is figure out how to do a protective waveguide to get some of that solar radiation to go around Earth and not just go right <laughs> into it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we're thinking on bigger scales. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Never hurts to think about it because, I mean, I, in my career, there have been all sorts of things that I've seen that at first glance, I'm like, this just looks ridiculous. This will never work. And then like a few years later, somebody's like, oh, look, here's a practical prototype. And yeah. so I, I've learned to keep my mouth shut at those moments. And <laughs> if it's not Absolutely. obviously wrong, I'm not going to criticize it. <laughs> <laughs> Let people be creative. People yeah. can take take things places. Yeah. Is there anything that we've missed talking about? What are you doing next? Are you writing another book? Are you, what are you working on? I mean, I know um, pandemic has kind of affected oh, yeah. everybody's lives, but. <laughs> um, yeah, as, as it turns out, I'm right. I'm now writing that history of invisibility physics book that I alluded cool. to earlier. Um, it's a, invisibility also has a longer history than you'd think. I can trace it back. In science, I can trace it back a hundred years. In science fiction, I can go back you know, 200 years. So the book is a bit of, okay, here's what the science fiction authors said. Here's what the scientists did and sort of the interplay between what's how science fiction authors thought it would work and how it ended up actually working or not working. Very cool. So we'll definitely have to get you back on to talk about your book when you're, when you're, act, when you're done with that. But yep. 
So for one the time quick being, question about okay. invisibility. Can I ask one? one? Since you brought up the science fiction thing. If I myself was invisible, would I need to take my clothes off to be invisible? <laughs> um, it, yeah, it depends on the type of invisibility you would you would use. Like if you were going to have an invisibility cloak that would guide light around you, then you could keep your clothes on. If you were doing some sort of chemical invisibility where you were altering your own body structure to make you invisible, then you'd either have to be able to apply that same process to your clothes or lose them. Okay. Yeah, and you'd have to shave your head. That's the other. <laughs> you'd have to because that's dead material. It's not going to be affected. Right. All the hair has to go. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. And, oh, and nobody, it's nobody like ever, the worst green screen ever. Yeah. And nobody ever explains what happens when you're invisible and you get dirt on you. I mean, yes. yeah. but you, you stand in a room for 10 minutes, you're covered in dust. Uh -huh. yeah. Big dust bunny. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, I almost, a funny, you almost a asked funny my shape of dust like a person. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> weird. That wasn't there before. Oh. Nikki, you almost asked my favorite question uh, at the end there. I think you kind of did, but then uh, maybe you backed off of it, which is, uh, uh, is there a question we didn't ask that you'd like to answer? Um, oh, I wish I had a good, I wish I had a good answer answer in the form of a question to that question. Well, then there isn't. Then we covered it all. That's the it. answer's That's nine it. to that question, yeah. right? Not, yeah, and, yeah. The, and this took us back to the inverse problem in our questioning. Yeah, we'll we start go. with the, we'll start, do you have any good answers? And then we'll, uh, we'll formulate the questions to go with those later. Getting, getting panic flashbacks to my PhD <laughs> defense now. Same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. I, I, this has been fun. <laughs> oh, it's been so great. Thank you for joining us. Where can people find you and uh, yeah, and your book that is out right now? Um, my book is Falling Felines and Fundamental Physics. You can find it through any, any bookstore or online bookseller. It's by from Yale University Press. Um, Gregory J. Gabor is what it's under. Um, Otherwise, I have my blog, which is called Skulls in the Stars, skullsinthestars.com. I write about, it, it's really sort of a hobby blog. So I write about science, history of science, Dungeons and Dragons, book reviews of horror fiction that I find entertaining, whatever catches my mood. Um, and I'm also on Twitter as Dr. Sky Skull. There you'll find me often just making snarky comments and ranting about things. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> sounding, viral comments. Yeah, sounding borderline <laughs> unstable, though usually it's an act. I, I have <laughs> to say, I have to just admit to our listeners here that your yours is one of my favorite Twitters to read. I, oh, thank you. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. It's very well curated of you know absurdity and uh, candor and like outrage and quirk. It's great. I love it. Well, thank you. I, I, yeah, I really just try and be honest and also try to be informative and not too grim. I think that is, uh, that's a good balance and hard, hard to take. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't want to keep you up too late tonight. It's been wonderful to speak with you and your cats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, yeah, it's been great talking to all of you uh, live, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. I would love that. Thank you so much. Have a all great right. night. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. All it's right, everybody. Too that he said live because obviously he is he pre-recorded that on a VHS cassette a decade <laughs> ago, and <laughs> and knew could predict all of our responses, all the to questions everything. and the and answers. He's that good a tape. physicist. Yeah, that's right. You just laid it right out there. <gasps> hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for This Week in Science. That was a fantastic interview. If you loved the interview, you know we love to bring episodes and interviews and shows like this to you every single week. So you can help us out by heading over to our Patreon page. Go to twist.org, click on that Patreon link, choose your level of support, and help us keep doing this show week in, week out. Your support really is what allows us to do this show. $10 and more a month. It's really not that much. It's like less than a cup of coffee per week. We're asking $10 and more or more per month, and we will say thank you by name at the end of the show. We really can't do this without you. Thank you so much for your support. And now... 
we're going to come on back into the next segment of our show. This is This Week in Science, and it is now time for something we love to call Blair's Animal Corner. Oh, with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a little Oh, I got so excited dancing, I didn't even open my stories. Uh, so- <laughs> So first, I have a story, uh, kind of a callback from a story a couple weeks ago. I have a new study, um, this time from, uh, now I lost it already, um, University of Pennsylvania. Yep, there it is. Okay, I found it. It's because I, I kept clicking back to the story from several weeks ago from Italy. I was like, no, but that's not it. No, that's not it. It's a, a proof of concept study, once again, on the efficacy of dogs sniffing out COVID. So this is looking at specifically trained detection of COVID-19. And this was with 96% accuracy. That is Whoa. better than some COVID tests we are currently using. So the the thing that's really interesting about this is that they pulled dogs that had um, no experience in scent training. They got eight Labradors and one Belgian Malinois. They had never done medical detection work before. And first they trained them to recognize a distinctive scent, a synthetic substance known as a universal detection compound, a UDC. They used a scent wheel. So there were 12 ports they had different samples in each port and they rewarded the dog when they they found the UDC. So after that, then they started training them to respond to urine samples from SARS-CoV-2 patients and uh, discern the positive from the negative samples. The, the negative samples had the exact same inactivation treatment beforehand. So they made sure they they controlled for anything possible going on with the way that the urine was being processed. And after three weeks of training all nine dogs, they were able to readily identify the COVID positive samples with 96% accuracy. Their sensitivity and their ability to avoid false negatives was a little bit tougher because of a couple things. Um, One is their, their testing was very strict. So if a dog walked by a port containing a positive sample, even once without responding, they couldn't circle back to it. That was a miss. And the Mm. other was that um, they were thrown off by a patient that tested negative, but who had recently recovered from COVID, which totally makes sense that they would carry compounds that maybe would end up being a red herring in that case. And there is, they have shown that some people, even though they've recovered symptom wise, do carry a a low viral load in their Uh blood for a long time that they actually you know that that it it wanes it takes a long time to wane for some people yeah absolutely so if you have a chat room wants sample size chat room wants sample size yeah yeah i said eight labrador retrievers and a belgian malinois so this is nine dogs this is again a proof this is a proof of concept study okay Mm -hmm. but this is also coming out of the same um dog training lab that has previously been used to uh, identify things like ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, this is something that is coming from a pretty, a pretty um, fleshed out, pretty robust precedent of dogs being able to sniff out medical issues. And so um, this is something that is piggybacking on that. And again, if dogs can do this, this could really benefit um, a lot of the ways that we do COVID testing in the future. So I'm on the record saying I don't believe any of this. Yeah, I recall that. And, That's why I brought this. Yeah. <laughs> and it really makes perfect sense. You know, uh, the, the, the dog's olfactory sense, the, their ability to smell uh, is, is like living in a world with 
all of the colors and the numbers and the letters and the everything else and the connotations of and the mental connections between what you think about a color and what it feels like and all that, all at once in their olfactory. They've got such a high fidelity sense of smell that in nature it is utilized for sniffing out molecules drifting in the wind or latent ones that have been left somewhere on a plant or in the ground so they can track uh, and repurposing that nature can be anything, can be any molecule. Well, but also but, just think about how how many animals depend on being able to tell who is sick. How yeah. many animals are there in the animal kingdom that we see treat sick individuals differently for whatever reason? Maybe they isolate them. Maybe they give them extra care. Maybe they give them extra food. It depends on the animal and the social connections they have. But this is or, a very common response, not to mention... I do think that if we did some studies on humans in this, this would be a thing. Because have you ever been told that you have sick breath? Because this is something that I have That's experienced. Just you. No, no, I have experienced on other people. <laughs> this is a thing, right? Is that you, and you know, this could be totally unrelated, but still there's an opportunity for there to be chemical signaling happening at every level, whether we realize it or not. Yep. Yeah, I, I also. But it was to your point, I was going to follow up with the canines also sniff out the sick because that's who they want to eat. Yes, also that. And they're also s sniffing out the, the sick bison because it's going to move a little slower than the rest. They just need yeah. to separate it from the herd a bit and then they'll catch it. Well, not to mention dogs can tell if you're about to have a seizure or if your blood sugar drops. Dogs are very good at these medical things. So it's anyway, it's, it's a dog. there's a whole lot of stuff here. And basically, you're going to see more and more of these stories propping up. We don't think this is our last coronavirus. So this is a good thing to have in the pocket, even if it doesn't get figured out by the time COVID's over, which it never will. I just will. want to make but it clear. Anyway. I'm now on the record as okay. completely believing it. You, you flipped. That's great. Okay. You've come That's to the side of science. New evidence. science. I appreciate that. Um, okay. And next, I would like to move on to beetle pee. Um, so this is from University from of... People Pee to Beetle Pee. There yeah. you go. So Justin, help me say Copenhagen. Copen... Uh, Co uh, Copenhau. Copen... Copenhau. 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 So from yeah. University of Copenhau. Um, <laughs> sounds terrible coming out of my mouth. Um, anyway, um, this is looking at beetles and how to kill them. Currently... On Earth today, one in every five animals on our planet is a beetle. There are a lot of beetles on our planet. About 25% of global food production is lost due to insects, mainly beetles. So if we can find a way to control beetle populations, particularly around agriculture, this could be beneficial. The problem is, how do we currently control insects? with insecticides that paralyze an insect's nervous system. The problem with that is it's not very species specific. <laughs> nervous systems are similar across insect species. And if you use insecticides, they tend to kill everything, including bees, butterflies, you name it. So it would be beneficial to come up with an insecticide that would just target the pests themselves without getting into the whole philosophical conversation about what really is a pest, but whatever, we're gonna shelve that right now. We're gonna recognize that we have the agriculture that we have and we need to protect it. So um, knowing that researchers from University of Copenhagen, <laughs> um, they- Copenhagen is fine, just say Copenhagen. Yes. Okay, it's fine. Copenhagen. Fine. Wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen. They have discovered which hormones regulate urine formation in the kidneys of beetles. What does that mean? So that means that they can cause beetles to create so much urine that they die of dehydration. Basically, they pee themselves to death. <laughs> So the, the inspiration, what? yeah, the inspiration <laughs> for this study, very interesting, ancient Egyptians, they knew that if they mixed teeny tiny pebbles into grain stores, that the stones would scratch away the waxy outer layer of beetles on their exoskeletons, which is there to reduce evaporation. And so it would kill beetles due to fluid loss from evaporation because they damaged that waxy layer with the stones. Of course, they would sometimes end up 
chomping down on some stones in their grain stores, but it was worth it because it wasn't infested with beetles. So knowing that, they wanted to see if they could find a chemical, more targeted way to use this kind of inspiration. So they, they were able to design a molecule that resembles this hormone. The, the big kind of question mark here is that in this research, they had to inject the hormone into their bodies so that it would then regulate urine formation. And so this study does demonstrate that the beetle will regulate their kidney function. Um, that first of all, they do it totally different from other insects. And second of all, that they can affect how that kidney function is working through this hormone injection to fatally disrupt the fluid balance in their bodies. So now the next step is gonna be to figure out how to get it into the beetles through their exoskeletons, by feeding it to them, somehow they have to figure out the kind of the delivery method to prove kind of the secondary proof of concept to see if it could actually work as a pesticide. But it appears to be very effective at mimicking that hormone and making them just pee forever until they die. Wow. I think there are a lot more things to consider. I mean, okay, it's great. They've got this unique protein. Is it really unique? Are we sure if we get this chemical into the environment? Because that's probably how it would have to be released mm -hmm. to be taken up by the beetles. Right. Could it have any other effects? But mm -hmm. um, it's a fascinating idea. I mean, it would be like giving somebody uh, a whole bunch of coffee <laughs> and right. never letting them drink water. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, suddenly so diuretic. You're going to you are you've had too much. Yeah. This is why I'm kind of of two minds here. So one, I totally agree with you because yes, this thing mimics this hormone. Yeah. Might it also mimic something else in another species? We don't know. Might this hormone have something to do in another species we haven't found yet? We don't know. So I agree with you there, except for the fact that our current pesticides, we are just spraying, just spraying out there yeah, neuro inhibitors. Yes. Just like, let me just destroy the nervous system of all things with exoskeletons out here. So I think in a vacuum, yes, we need to be more measured about this. But recognizing where we live in the current world, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, un unintended consequences if we can figure as much out as possible before putting anything in the environment, that's always the better course of action. Although, yeah, we've done so much wrong. Maybe we can start doing things better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then uh, yeah, speaking of doing things though. better, I have one yeah. more quick story in the end. Okay. It's about snake venom. This is from Clemson University looking at snake diets and the type of venom that they have in their body. And they found that the number of prey species a snake ate, that did not drive venom complexity, but the types of prey species and how different they were from each other evolutionarily did drive venom complexity. So if a snake eats 20 different mammal species, not very complex. But if it eats a centipede, a frog, a bird, and a mammal, very complex venom. So they have to have an arsenal that is more diverse to be able to eat all of these different things, which could help mm. us create better anti-venoms. One, which, you know, we have a whole database of, of anti-venoms in the United States worldwide. It's pretty amazing but it could be better. And so knowing the most we possibly can about snake venom will save lives, definitely. But secondarily, <laughs> venom is also often used to create medicine. And so the more we know about venom, there's a potential for kind of unlocked drug capabilities that we don't even know about yet. So for example, snake venom um, derived drugs treat heart disease, high blood pressure, blood clots, makes, makes sense. A lot of venoms are anticoagulants, right? Um, so they can take a lot of that information and help human medicine. So yeah. not only is this helping us understand snakes better, just evolutionarily and for the interest of the study of snakes, but it's also helping us 
save lives from snake bites and potentially unlock some some interests for human medicine. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. That sounds like it's win, 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 yeah. right? It's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Knowing more about snakes is a win, 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 win. Yeah. Also because they're cool. They are cool. They're so cool. Uh, Justin dropped out. I don't know where he went. His internet seemed to crash. Um, and so I don't know where he went. Is my internet okay? Your internet's fine. Great. Good. Do you want to tell us some science while we wait for Justin? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I just wanted to make sure it was not my end <laughs> as well. Just do it. Last minute checks. Arm waving. A little bit of arm waving. Mm -hmm. hmm. Do you appreciate a bit of honey with your tea? A little honey in the cocktail you might be drinking. A little honey on your peanut butter and banana toast. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> banana. Out of here. Right. Well, okay. So, you know, bananas could be a little bit radioactive and it's because of the potassium they take up. Well, a lot of plants actually, they take up potassium and they can actually get fooled by radio cesium, which is radioactive cesium, and they can take up this radio cesium in place of potassium and it gets incorporated into their tissues and into their pollens. And a researcher and his students just found that flowering plants across the country probably are still incorporating radio cesium from the nuclear tests that we did back in the 1950s and 1960s. And that honey samples brought by the students when they went away for spring break back to the campus, half of, at least half of them, a little more than half of them, were radioactive and had radio cesium in the honey. It's not a lot of radio cesium. It's yeah, not it's not like, going to kill anybody. It's not. No, it's not dangerous. It's well, well below dangerous radioactive levels. But what this implies is that you know there's all sorts of foods that we eat all sorts of things in our environment that are sticking around and that decades ago over 50 years ago that we uh, did nuclear bomb testing and the russians did nuclear bomb testing that it got a, the the radiation ended up in the atmosphere it ended up in the soil and that is still circulating and that some organisms can concentrate that, radioact that radioactivity. Um, and then it continues to cycle and concentrate. So, so future scientists will find our bodies and <laughs> see them full of plastic uh, isotopes and, and plastic. Yes. yes. <laughs> so wait, like, what were they who doing? Are they, who are these people? Yeah. How did they even live? <laughs> yeah. But it's an important part of figuring out how our ecosystems work mm -hmm. to understand stuff like this. So may not have been too surprising to a lot of people, but, you know, a lot of people eat their honey because it's healthy and they're now maybe going to go, oh, no, radioactive honey. But it's not that bad. It's just maybe just a little bit of radioactivity. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's totally yeah. fine. Yeah. It's fine. And then I wanted to dive into some fun stories about T-Rexes because for whatever reason, this last week, there were about three stories about yes. T-Rexes that were, these. they were so fascinating. So yes. first off, T-Rexes were slow and imagery in, in movies of these storming T-Rexes able to run at 30 miles an hour. That's really, really not likely. They were very, very heavy. And most likely, T-Rexes were uh, very slow, only mm -hmm. walking, uh, maybe moving at about three miles per hour, five kilometers per hour. 
Well, if they Which, were scavengers, then what? Where? What are they running for? They're giants. Exactly. Nothing's right. hunting them. <laughs> so, were they hunting or not? Another study found that T. Rexes, in I love this, in a quarry in Utah that is called the Rainbows and Unicorns Quarry. It is a. They found a number of fossils. Many of them seem to be a group of T. rex individuals that died together. And their hypothesis, it was the result of either some kind of biological poisoning by a microorganism or fire or flooding. The preferred hypothesis at this point is that they died due to a flood altogether. But the fact that their bones are all found together adds more evidence to a growing body of fossil evidence that T. rexes were not solitary hunters, Hmm. that they were group, they were social group animals. And maybe they hunted in packs or in in a cooperative manner or scavenged in a cooperative Hmm. manner. Think about turkey vultures. There's always a bunch of them because they're following the scent, right? Right, if they're scavengers, so maybe maybe the other hypothesis there isn't that they scavenged together, but maybe they followed the scent, slowly moved their way to the dead thing, and then a group of T-Rexes fought each other mm-hmm. over dead things. Or uh, a carcass fell into some quicksand, and then they all just kept following it in. <laughs> they all kept falling in, which is, yep, highly likely. And finally, the uh, last study was another uh, piece of work estimating, and this was in uh, Nature, I believe, but another piece of work estimating the number of tyrannosaurs that had potentially lived on Earth. They estimated it to be some 2.5 billion dinosaurs over a period of Two and a half million years, mind you. So this is a long period of time. But that there could have been at any one time about 20,000 adult T-Rex individuals between 68 million and 65.5 million years ago. Yeah, this was in science. So just to let you know, there are about 3,900 tigers left on our planet. To give you an idea here. And if we think of T-Rex as a a major part of the ecosystem, how and how big they were, how many other dinosaurs did there have to be for 20,000 T-Rexes to be crawling around at one time? So the the num it when you start thinking of ecosystem interactions and number of individuals to support individuals, then you start realizing how many, (laughs) how many dinosaurs there were. We need to find more rainbow and unicorn quarries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I also looked up, there's about 39,000 giraffes left on our planet and around between 12 and 15,000 bison, American bison. So yeah. More than there are bison. Just picture T Rexes roaming around. <laughs> wow! Well, and I'm going to picture them time. in big groups. Yeah. <laughs> Thousands of T Rexes with their little arms. What? What, Justin? Sorry. All right, so I'm going to jump on ahead. The to only, my... I was going to say the only place I'd, I've, I've seen bison is in uh, the uh, Golden Gate Park. Mm-hmm. So, so like at first I'm like, yeah, but when do you ever see? Oh yeah, if there were T Rexes running around Golden Gate Park, yeah, that would yeah. be that would be pretty interesting. Just go to the Midwest. There's plenty of bison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is interesting also because of the fact that this study specified only 20,000 adult T-Rexes because Mm -hmm. they only looked at that form. And now we know that juvenile and adults had different body forms and they survived eating different kinds of foods. So how many juvenile T-Rexes were there? Mm -hmm. Lots more. 
So, yeah, so fascinating, fascinating uh, view of that, was it, Cretaceous period Mm -hmm. of North America's history. This isn't like all over the world either. It's like North America. Anyway, my final story for the night, I want to talk about a a glance, a, a gaze. What happens when I look into your eyes? What happens when somebody, you catch somebody looking out of the corner of their eye and then looking at you? What does it make you do? How does it make you feel? Do I know them or not? I feel like it's very dependent on if I know them or not. Regardless of whether you know them, other people's gazes capture our attention. And a new study that's out this week from the University of Geneva finds that when people make eye contact with other people, it solicits that attention. Not only is attention solicited, that cognitive process distorts temporal perception. So you actually overestimate, or you un- actually you actually underestimate the amount of time that was spent being consciously aware of that gaze because your brain is working on it. And so time is dilated when people look at you and you look at them. You have mental, mental time dilation because of people's eyes looking at you. So the researchers had different situations and measured what was going on in, in people's uh, people's cognitive functioning, and they measured their uh, perception of time, had them tell the researchers how long this thing took or that thing took as they were looking at these faces. And they had these faces look at the subjects, either just a face staring and not moving, a moving face where the eyes came to look at the subject, just the eyes moving to look at the subject, or inanimate objects. And they found that the eyes moving and the head moving are a very important part of this time dilation. So if there is just like a mannequin with its eyes straight, and you recognize, your brain recognizes that as a human face, Nothing happens because that face, it, you might have passed its field of vision, but that face is not actively looking at you. It's just gazing into the distance. But the faces that moved and the eyes that moved, whether or not it was uh, just the eyes moving or the whole head and eyes moving, those elicited time dilation in the brain. So this also gets at this question of, you know, how masks are potentially affecting our ability to, uh, you know, to communicate with people. Um, They're not affecting our gaze. And even if your face, your mask, your, your lower face is covered, your eyes are still going to be able to elicit, solicit attention in other people's brains and start cognitive processes that lead to connection. So human gaze is a whole thing with dogs, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so dogs are really good at following human gaze. But, for example, wolves are are not great at it. I thought this is is happening again. I thought it was the opposite. Okay, I'll double check. But I'm pretty sure that is the situation. I thought that the wolves were actually better. Because the the whole point of that study was the fact that uh, we thought this has been this sort of shared history training up of dogs watching us and us watching dogs over the millennia. And then it turns out wolves are just better at it than dogs. So my recollection is that this was their proof that dogs uh, and wolves um, have a much farther back evolutionary convergence. And so this was actually an indication that um, it was something that dogs developed completely separately and in their own timeline, apart Mm. from other canines. Um, I remember the result of that being completely the opposite. So we have to go look at this. We have to go find this out. Well, I found the study. It's from 2019. So So I had it backward i'm gonna go find my no, I'm, study i'm reading it right now okay I'm reading it. Well, oh, we will do it in the after show we'll, do it. we'll yeah, make we'll it talk a about it in the after yeah. show it's 
fine. I'll put this in the show notes for later. <laughs> but anyway, gaze is something that we study with humans in relation to other animals, is my point. So gaze is an important social signal, not just human to human. That was the Absolutely. whole reason I brought it up. Yeah, yeah. It's important. It's important across animal species. And it is interesting also for animal different species animal interactions the animals we interact with, whether there are other human animals or dog animals or cat animals, how do the gazes interact? But amazing that just catching a gaze can affect your sense of time. Mm -hmm. Mental time dilation with a look. Hey, Justin. Do you have stories? Hi. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Things? Yes, if my, uh, my internet might be... Uh... Uh, getting wonky here so okay, if i start great. breaking up just let me know and i'll, I'll uh, okay so uh when you think of a creature that travels really well one that has spanned the globe uh, a super disperser that goes everywhere one creature that probably doesn't come to mind is one of those you'd find everywhere anywhere kind of creatures is the tarantula tarantulas are very much like hobbits from tolkien's middle earth uh, they're not fond of big adventures. They prefer to keep to their burrows, uh, only occasionally leaving to find food or mates. Unlike hobbits, though, tarantulas are absolutely everywhere. Uh, so how did this uh, the six uh, out of seven continents have tarantulas on them? So how does a big hairy spider that doesn't like to leave the burrow that has usually a very tightly controlled area within which it operates, how does that creature end up spreading across the entire planet? International team of researchers, including uh, Carnegie Mellon's University's uh, Sersha Foley, set out to uh, sort of figure out how this came about. They did basically like a genomic 23andMe type of uh, thing for the tarantulas, trying to figure out where their, where their genes come from. They've published this in Peer J, uh, online Peer J. is where it's been published. You want to go look it up there. So they used transcriptomics to build a genetic tree of spiders and then time calibrated their tree with fossil data. And despite the fact that tarantula fossils are extremely rare, they were able to sort of backtrack tarantula emergence uh, from places. So they found now that they considered the Americas about the uh, Americas about 120 million years ago, Cretaceous period. So aside from there being 20,000 T Rexes, there were also uh, plenty of tarantulas in North America at the time. And South America as well, India, Australia all, Australia, all these places that they reached, they did so mostly a long time ago. They found a couple of lineages that colonized Asia about 20 million years apart from each other. Uh, but they, they actually made it across the boundaries between uh, Australia and Asian islands where many other species sort of had a hard stop from, from exploring into. And basically what it came down to, why the tarantula is so successful, such a global trotter, is that it's really good with niches. They're just really good at finding uh, a little spot uh, in, the, in the food web and owning it without having to force anything out or compete too much with anything. In fact, one of the the there's been uh, the species that they that inhabited, I think Asia at the time were both a forest dwelling, like an arboreal dwelling, like a tree dwelling version, and a burrowing uh, ver, uh, version that didn't uh, interact with each other, that didn't intermix because they both had their little their little niche, and they just kept to it, little burrows, kept to the little Hobbit Shire, didn't explore, didn't like rabble rousing. Didn't make troublemakers. And just by doing that, they're really good. In fact, some of the con the continental conquests that they made were because the continents moved away from each other or crashed into each other. That's how they got from India to Asia is the continent crashed into the other continent. And Spider's like, okay, I guess we uh, it's one more continent. <laughs> we'll just take that. 
I'll do that. Go. Whether by but, burrow, by tree, by air. Yeah, just as long as there's no flying tar tarantulas next. Yeah. yeah, but the looks of it, it's just by not being... Uh, by, well, even when, when being invasive, not being too off-putting when you get there. Yeah. Not, taking, <laughs> not taking up much of a footprint, even though you've got eight legs. Uh, shift work. Shift work is my final yeah. story today. Shift Let's work is hear this bad news. Often, <laughs> but no, so here's the thing. It's often been uh, maligned as bad for your health. Uh, but will this new deeper dive study make us rethink benefits associated with a flexible no. work schedule? No. No, <laughs> there's nothing. No. There's nothing <laughs> good. According to new research from University of Waterloo, shift work is just plain bad for human health. It causes all sorts of health-related issues that affect our defense against disease and, and infection because when you mess with the circadian clock, you disrupt the sleep-wake schedule and feeding patterns. And these are the things that uh, actually are part of your immune system's rhythm as well. Interestingly, though, it appears as though it affects men worse than women. Uh, men have yeah. a, a, a larger negative reaction than women, according to this study. I want, uh, we've talked before about hormones being involved. Uh, and I think it's just, just such an interesting question as to what would make that, make it work that way. Mm -hmm. Why? What does uh, melatonin or um, any of the circadian clocks, how does that affect the immune system differently in the different sexes with different levels of sex hormones? And yeah. So and next, the... I, need the, I need to figure out what, if there is anything that actually helps because like, yeah, th there's melatonin you can buy, you can buy sun lamps, you can do all sorts, you can eat chocolate. We talked about that on the show once. So yeah, I want scientific studies that actually shows what can um, help offset that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one would be a uh, day job. Day job will help. Not everyone can be a day I job. I know. Well, day everyone job. can work towards a day job. <laughs> all Even I'm if saying it's a little is less money. When you, when you get hurt in the middle of the night and you have to go to the ER, you're very happy that there are people working at night in the ER. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So if this is affecting inflammation. Are we just so talking about Brian now? <laughs> yeah, now we're just talking about Brian. Yeah. <laughs> So we start understanding exactly how shift work affects everything, and then we can start really targeting the responses and the treatments mm -hmm. to it. But if what we are looking at is a disruption of the inflammatory physiological response, then how can you ameliorate inflammation, right? So the next, I think the next step would be um, regardless, as a shift worker, what would be the things that you could do in your life to decrease inflammation? Anti-inflammatory diet. I mean, you don't necessarily want to take NSAIDs every single day because that's not good for mm -hmm. your liver and kidney. But is what else can you do to to make inf just reduce the the the, mm -hmm. the possibility of inflammation? Yeah, so the, part of it too is I guess there is natural times like uh, you're not supposed to get an infection right before bed because uh, <laughs> your your body is better prepared to fight off infection the next morning. Uh, it, like oh, there's that's why you always feel really bad right before bedtime. Like, I don't feel good anymore. Your body's <laughs> like, no, go to bed. <laughs> but there, yeah, but there's natural cycles of of our immune system sort of uh, beefing up and shutting down, and uh, these cycles that we go through. And when you mess with circadian rhythms and you don't let your body have those sort yeah. of natural cyclical processes that take place on a daily, daily basis. Uh, it's overproducing or underproducing or just giving up on you completely. Just forget it. You just, Don't let it give up. Yeah. Never give up. Never give in. And then in the case of the men, I guess that the, uh, the immune system has an, uh, tends to overreact, uh, leading to potential higher, higher rates of sepsis. Oh, yeah. So the men are so strong that they're feeling extra bad. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, there might be some sort of like uh, ancestral biological thing about men getting more infections. Yeah, I don't or know. this is man flu. This is just more man flu stuff. <laughs> this is more. Oh, but, that's... <laughs> but I mean, similar to that, like COVID is an inflammatory disease, and yeah. men are affected worse more often. So it's it's you know there yeah. there is precedent. Yeah, well, and man flu is a real yes. thing. Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Blair, this yeah. is the, probably the first time I'd ever heard you say that men don't overreact <laughs> to things that affect women. There's just no men way. aren't overreacting. Yeah. They actually feel bad. Yeah. yeah. When they feel bad, they feel bad. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Have a little yeah. bit of. Yeah. yeah as someone Double said in the chat room, men do have a higher stress level than women. So. It's tough to be a man. Well, it is because we have to, not only do we have to deal with all the stresses of, you know, society and all this, we also have to deal with women. You should just show yourself out right now, yeah, Justin. Yeah. Bye, Justin. See you never. Bye. Tune in next week to find out who the third host is. It's Rachel, isn't it? It's going to be Rachel. <laughs> Oh, have we made it to the end of the show? Yeah. Yeah. Did we do it? We got through all the stories. This was a fun show. Might not have gotten there soon enough. (laughs) (laughs) Minute early, I would have been okay. (laughs) Thank you for helping to host this show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And shout outs to the people who really helped this show. Fada, thank you for help with social media and the show notes. Extra work this weekend with the uh, crossover show. Very, very appreciated that you spent time on that. that. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Again, being there this weekend, it's fantastic. Everyone who did show up live on Saturday to see our crossover show with DTNS, thank you so much for being there. Love the fact that you joined us for... it It was a really fun show. It was really great. And again... If you are a Patreon sponsor, then you'll be getting that uh, that show in your uh, podcast feed over there as well when I put that in. <sighs> I guess it is time now to thank our Patreon sponsors also. Oh, and gosh darn it, Rachel. I forgot Rachel. I didn't put... Rachel, thank you for your assistance. Very much. Thank you. Who's now, this, Rachel? <laughs> I tried to have a meeting, and then you went to Denmark, and now I can't have a meeting. (laughs) (sighs) Thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Carl Kornfeld, Jen Myronick, Melanie Stegman, Akramsta, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Begard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Don Stylo, Nathan, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Scioli, Guillaume, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov, Sharma, Shoe Brew, Darwin Handen, Hannon, Darnold Munda, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Josh Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hesflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Mazaros, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Robert Coburn, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon button. And on next week's show... We will be back uh, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, uh, 5 a.m. Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube, Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe catch up on your science while you do some dishes? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. 
For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in that subject line, or your email will be spam filtered under an invisibility cloak. We'll no, never see you'll it. never find it again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science 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 This week in science, 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 science. This week in science. This week in Science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. This week in science. I swear I hit the button. Chick, boom, chick, boom, boom. Boom, chick, boom, boom. <laughs> Everyone in the chat room wants more Roger and Tom on twists. Noodles says, 
we need to we need to take Roger from DTNS. <laughs> we will take him. I don't know. We'll get Tom every week. Yeah, we'll get him up. We'll just do a crossover every week. It'll be no problem. It'll be no problem. Glad you enjoyed the video on demand, Gord. It's great. Oh, we are in the after show right now. It's the part of the show that's after the show, but that's still kind of the show. Saturday was a lot of fun. Identity for that was fantastic. What's the movie for tonight? <laughs> what are we watching together, everybody? I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. My I came home. I left. Uh, I, I I came home today, and my son and husband have been um, binging on old Godzilla movies. Oh, that's fun. Yes, so I came home to my son furiously telling, explaining to me the the son of Godzilla and how incredibly bad it was. <laughs> and then he had to show me. And for anyone who has never seen Son of Godzilla... <laughs> I think I've seen most of them. Baby Godzilla is... Let me Google it. Interesting looking... Son of Godzilla. Yep. Baby Godzilla. That's it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby Godzilla. That's. Oh, no. <laughs> Fascinating. What, what, did, what were they thinking? He what looks like a monkey. I don't know. No, he no, he doesn't. He's no. It looks got, like the it looks tail. like the, the baby from Dinosaurs TV show. Not oh, the mama. Does a Not little the bit. mama. Not the mama. Yeah, maybe a little bit like that. It's got a flat face, and I guess they must have. It, they dropped him first day on the set, and they were like, "It's fine. It's fine. It's gonna be fine." No, no, baby Godzilla is. And you can find pictures on the internet, How but watching it, watching it move. Scales? What? Why is he all smooth skinned like a, like a frog? Yes. So Godzilla looks more crocodile-y and baby Godzilla is like more froggish. It's weird. Like a naked ninja turtle. Thank you very much, Goro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have a good night Fada yes Godzilla movies are great with MST MST3K treatment for sure I think that's how I saw most of them here we go yeah but uh yeah and then the other one the other one they saw while I was gone was Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla mm -hmm. which again yep. is another good mm -hmm. one with aliens and a, what is it? Sir Caesar, King Caesar, something like that. Yeah. Ooh, ouch, Stephen Rain. So, Godzilla oh, represents the, uh, the, the atomic the, bomb. What was the, uh, what was the study you found about the dogs and wolves thing? So I have, I have six studies open. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. And they're all what? conflicting. Really? Unfortunately, really? yeah. So there's one from 2003 <laughs> saying um, that the um, that dogs or that wolves. Where did it go? So here's one from 2003 saying that um, uh, the same dog human communication via faces cannot be achieved in wolves, even after extended socialization. So that happened in 2003. Interesting. That's like the opposite of what I just read. Right. In 2011, <laughs> they, uh, is this the one I think? Yes. Where they domesticated wolves 
and then the mm. wolves did well at gazing yeah. and actually did better at gazing far than away dogs. than dogs. Mm -hmm. um, but the up close thing, I think the dogs still did better at puzzles or something. I don't know. So that was in 2011. Then uh, in 2019, there was a study about the facial muscles and how dog faces are structured to be able to receive the human gaze and repeat it back in a way that wolves cannot. Hmm. So, and then so, so this dogs, one, dogs are better about telling humans, I get it. October 2020 is saying that dogs um, are staring at the back of your heads just as much as they're staring at your face. So that happened in October of 2020. Um, and then uh, the same, that was a Smithsonian study, also a Smithsonian um, publication from 2018 found that uh, dogs and wolves were, con uh, their convergent origin is way further back than we thought. Hmm. So, so this is what I'm saying. This is a mess. <laughs> we don't know. I think, I think that's the answer is I can say with distinction, jury's out. <laughs> okay. The one I was, uh, the one I think I might, uh, was there's, yeah, there is one with the pointing that mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, the wolves might've been better at. The this pointing. is. Uh, I didn't find the yeah. pointing one. No, I didn't either. Uh, but I do remember talking about that one at some point. Huh. So I don't know where that one hit. This there's one. Uh, uh, both dogs and wolves able to follow communicative cues to find hidden food. However, without direct eye contact, neither dogs nor wolves chose the correct object. Interesting. So they needed the. They both relied on uh, eye contact to find the the correct one the first time around. In the absence of a human. To show them where the food was located, only the wolves were able to make casual inferences in the experiment. Wolves showed the understanding of cause and effect that dogs lacked. But both of those, this was uh, University of Veterinary Medicine, Vienna. Uh, both were able to track eye contact mm -hmm. just fine. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. So I think, I mean, first of all, we could say like, more animals probably do this than we think. So it's not that weird if wolves could do it. Cause probably like there one study I looked at said there was even a recorded instance of a tortoise following human gaze. So like, is it, why is this the thing that we're deciding is the big difference between dogs? And I don't even know. Well, I mean, I think, I think the argument that was is made is that whether or not this is a shared communication based on domestication or the reason of domestication mm -hmm. is because of a shared ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, I think that's all. It is. And I think that is where the 2003 study came from because they were talking about the expressiveness of dog faces. That was the, and how, one. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. But, so but yeah. So anyway, yeah. that study, I think that's what that's about is about establishing the two way connection. Dogs which being able to mirror extremely us. Extremely unique, unique. Yes. Yeah. To, dogs and that wolves were not really interested in in communicating with humans in the same yeah. way i'm not going to tell you what i think i'm going yeah. to take your cues find out where the food is i'm going to go eat it and yeah. i'm going to go take a nap yeah which is also why like dog training and wild animal training are they have similar fundamentals they're they're pretty different <laughs> Anyway, yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it just, it really sounds like they don't know. <laughs> it really sounds like there's not a statistical difference between dogs and wolves because there keeps being these studies saying one thing or another. So if they did a meta-analysis, I'm guessing there wouldn't be much there. But yeah. That's a, that's a big assumption because I don't know what the sample sizes of each one of these was. Like maybe a couple of these sample sizes were 10 and a couple of these sample sizes were 200. So, you know, really difficult to say. I wonder, you know, this is 
communication, nonverbal communication through gaze, right? So Mm -hmm. can humans use our gaze to tell another species about something that their attention needs to go someplace else? Do these other species use gaze as a part of their communication to even begin to understand that we could do that? So if wolves, and so if dogs are doing it, it means that wolves probably can do it, but maybe with, I mean, maybe it's just the emphasis on it, the emphasis on on gaze is different. There's also a question of what we're studying at this point. Uh, this is an uh, international study showed that 60% of Eurasian gray wolf genomes carried blocks of domestic dog DNA. Mm-hmm. So if they've been crossbreeding for the last couple hundred years anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, are, that was another one. Is One studying? of those studies was comparing wolf dogs to dogs. Mm-hmm. So a wolf dog hybrid, I think, to just normal domestic dogs, which like... Mm-hmm. Okay, now I, I'm i not so sure about this. <laughs> but I don't know. Anyway, um, Gaurav wants to know what my curriculum for training Sadie is and when you know your dog has learned as much as they can, it's time to stop. It's never time to stop. Dogs really like training. They like, um, they need like puzzles and stuff. It's like a fun way to give them a, an exercise of the brain. So either continue doing what you're doing and just spend time working with them every day or try to teach them new things. I teach dogs tricks when I, it's, I probably annoy people. I always ask first, but when I visit somebody's house, I often will end up teaching their dog a trick while I'm sitting there. If, if the dog is okay to get lots of treats, I'll, I'll teach them something real quick. Cause it's just, it's very fun. Dogs want to learn. Um, they they want to, they to want it. to please. And yes. they like treats. I, I think, you know, and now we get into weird anthropomorphism, but I would not be surprised if there is a satisfaction in doing it right and getting your treat right away. Like mm-hmm. I did it. I did the thing she wanted. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's something to that too. But to answer your question, she currently does sit down, touch, she'll touch her nose to my hand when I move it around, um, shake, other paw. Um, and then uh, she's, she's medium at come. She's, she's not great. Um, and then uh, the thing that she does that's very impressive is she does wait. And so you can put a treat on her foot, you can put it on her nose, you can put it on her head, um, you can put it on her butt, and she will wait until you say okay, and then she'll eat the treat. Off of her butt? Yeah. <laughs> she's she's so long. Remember how long she is? <laughs> That's right. She, she's long and bendy. <laughs> my cat is not getting the... I, I'm petting my cat right now. She She's like, she keeps coming in here and she says, hi. You were gone for two days. Hi, hi, hi. Huh? Where'd you go? Hi, hi. You wanna you wanna go to bed? I like sleeping. Let's cuddle. Hi, hi. Let's come play with my toy. Okay, here's my toy. You wanna play with me? Okay. Oh. Yeah. She's my kitty. My yeah, Marshall said that he didn't even see her for two days and then I came home and she came out. Huh? <laughs> oh boy. My kitty. Alright, I gotta go start the day. You gotta yeah. start a day. Yeah. Good time for me. Sun's yeah. up. Ten thirty. What is it there now? Seven thirty. Seven thirty in the morning. Yeah. That is a great and, start to the day. And uh, Denmark just like fully opened. I think. Fully. Mm-hmm. Do you have to wear a mask still, or are masks not a thing anymore? Uh, yeah, masks are still a thing, but okay. you can now go to all of the restaurants and do all of the things nice. in the movies. Uh, apparently, though, there is a uh, central, they have a centralized everything here. So you have an app basically on your phone that can show that you have had a test within 72 hours. So I do believe you need to show that to get seated at a restaurant. Mm, You have like a a social passport for a recent test. You can just like, yep, there it is. Come on in. And 
So I think they are doing like you have to have that test good within the last 72 hours. Uh, but yeah. But there's yeah. testing. And I think we got the, the states pretty much has testing available on that scale now, I believe. Finally. So. Yeah, it's more available now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there is a, a, a prediction or a, the predictions keep coming out from uh, the IHME International something metrics health metrics evaluate anyway this group out of the university of washington and they do really great metrics on stuff they're really good at predicting things and um for people who have vaccine hesitancy i'm going to ask everyone who is getting a vaccine got a vaccine plans to get a vaccine please talk to people that you know who are hesitant about why you're choosing please try and talk with people empathetically without attacking them um you know don't joke about you know uh, people who don't get vaccines you know mother nature natural selection blah 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 is going to fix this we don't need more people to die. We don't need oh, to. Well, you do make a good point, though, Kiki. Now that you mentioned it, I hadn't thought of that. But it is yeah. sort but of. But there's like... also probably people you know who who can't get vaccines, which right. is there exactly people... why this right. is so important. Yes, there are people who can't get the vaccines. So I, my, and the prediction from this organization, this research group, is that uh, because of vaccine hesitancy and new variants, that we are going to see a bad resurgence of covid in the fall to winter so late 2021 into 2022 this is going to continue and we're going to have to keep doing measures and we're all tired so the one thing that we can do is try and help people understand how important vaccination is and how important it is to helping us safely reach herd immunity so that we can diminish the spread of the virus and avoid this predicted future that uh, that this group has has seen. So I don't want to go there. I want to have a nice yeah. winter. I want Blair to have a good wedding. I want, <laughs> I, want, I want all sorts of cool things to happen in the future. I don't want to feel like we have to wear masks all the time and that we have to be, you know, so vigilant all the time. I want us to be able to relax and rest. And we can only get there if everybody works together and 50% vaccination rate is not going to do it. We need 75% vaccination rate. We need to get people vaccinated. And it's up to us to talk to our friends, talk to our family, talk to the people that we know about why it's important because they're listening to their news sources and getting convinced, but maybe they haven't heard the words that you have to tell them. So just, yeah, just putting that out there because I, I want I, to be open in Denmark. I don't want Denmark to close. I want I things to open. I don't know anyone. <laughs> Guys, I don't know anyone uh, who has said they didn't want or wouldn't get or hasn't already gotten. Don't know anyone. I don't know. I don't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> You're lucky. That's that's mm -hmm. great. You're surrounded by by people like that. But there are many of us who aren't fully surrounded by people who will be vaccinated. And I think we all should be. So mm -hmm. it would be great. Yeah. 50% yeah. vaxxed, half vaxxed. That's good. People who've gotten the the Johnson and Johnson, you're one and done. I know. So, I'm I'm a limited edition. I'm a woman under 48 who got the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Ten. There might not well be done. any more of me. Well done. They might uh yeah, that might not be a thing anymore. Yeah, maybe not. Well, but I don't know. I guess uh, maybe, based maybe on not. the numbers though. So. Yeah. Based on the numbers, I mean, that's the last thing I heard was that they're they're probably going to release it for men over 48 or people over 48 first. in general yeah. first and then continue studying and then yeah. maybe later release it to everybody else. So it does seem like I'm in a I'm in a special club. Yeah. 
Yeah, anyone who can get in there, mm -hmm. get one of the two yeah. shots, you're at least partially there. You're starting. That does diminish mm -hmm. the chances. Even just one of the two Pfizer shots, one of the two Modernas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I, I will starts say diminishing returns on that on infection rates. So I don't know if this is true for you guys, but when I got mine, because mine was a whole special like come get them while they last sort of thing, um, I didn't know which one I was getting until I got yeah. there, and it does not matter to me at all. it, yeah. d it wouldn't matter because <laughs> they all protect me. <laughs> Get whichever vi whichever vaccine you can yeah. get. Pfizer yeah. does not have a single shot vaccine. Pfizer is only is only two shots. Yeah. Gaurav's getting the second shot on May third. That's awesome. Nice. Muffins. That would be so sweet. Yeah. Say thank you to the the pharmacists for to the yeah. healthcare professionals that help. Yeah. But anyway, don't forget you get a treat too. That's the you rule. Get that was that was the rule in my house growing up. You get a shot, you get a present. And yeah. I have carried that on into my adult life. You get a shot, you get a present. You, you get, get a, a present. Tooth, you get a filling, you get a present. If you have to go through something, like yeah, you get a present. Whether that's a nice meal yeah. or a special drink or yeah. you know and That's why everybody yeah. in her family has diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it used to be uh, I would go straight from the doctor to Toys R Us, and we would get to pick something under a certain dollar amount, anything we wanted in the store. Nice. Good old Toys R Us. The children today uh, will never know. My kids <laughs> actually got to see it, right? Really? Yes. Uh, we had one of, the, one of the biggest, oldest stores in existence in Sacramento, the Arden Fair Mall. Wow. And we got to go over there. It was like one of the last that closed. We got to go over there in the final days when they were like selling off uh, store fixtures at this point. Like, like they were selling the stands that would hold the toys even. Like everything was, and so yeah, they were like, uh, they got to see, got to see that. <laughs> Sad. Goodbye. Yeah, that's, that's not yeah. quite the experience that uh, I recall. Oh, no. <laughs> Now there's and there's nothing that's going to really replace no. a giant toy store with the toys that are all out and that's all that's there compared to a toy aisle. It's yeah. just not it's not the same no, no. vibe. But there's but there's no reason to pay for rent if you can just have a website, I guess. I don't know. And especially because like you would go to the Toys R Us hoping to get that particular action figure, that particular particular toy, and maybe they would have it and maybe they didn't. And mm -hmm. now since you can just order exactly what you want on the internet, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Get whatever you want. Yeah. Mr. Fiendish over in the Twitch chat already had a first shot. Kaiva Go is asking, what if you get the Pfizer shot and then a Johnson & Johnson one? Um, there's actually a story about that, that it's not recommended because mm. nobody has tested it. Um, and theoretically, you would be protected. Your body uh, would yeah. would have, you, you would be. So you know, here's you, the answer. Here's the answer. Go to your vaccinated. healthcare folks. When, when you get your, if you're getting a first shot of anything, they're signing you up for your second shot right there on the spot. Yeah. You have a date to come back. Now, yeah, yeah. So now, it happened. If, there's if a story of one guy who did it. There's this the one there's one guy who got like he, he went and got like one of each. Or he he, he got them mixed up. He's huh. fine. Yeah. But yeah. there is this yeah. did happen to somebody because yeah, he didn't you. pay attention. <laughs> so early on, <laughs> early on the C D C had said that because we didn't know if we would have what levels of which mm -hmm. at what point. Like there was distribution mm -hmm. problems. Actually, there was no distribution. There was problems. But the CDC is it was saying if you got one, and say it's Pfizer, and then for some reason Pfizer's not available in a month, get the other one. It's yeah. fine. Uh, well, but also Moderna. we might all be living that lifestyle pretty soon. But that hasn't really been to twelve months when we need a booster shot. And we have to do this whole rodeo again. They're they're probably not going to tell you to keep with whatever brand you started with. They're gonna nope. they're gonna tell you to get whatever. So it's it doesn't really matter. It's all creating immunity. It's all creating antibodies. 
So in the at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You're not supposed to mix or match them right now, but I do think it's funny that eventually we might all be mixing and matching. Eventually. Yeah, and when you hear about, when you read the news also about the Pfizer, everybody's talking now about the Pfizer's third shot. It's not like it's like two weeks later. It's like next year. Third mm -hmm. shot? Like oh. It's like a booster, booster shot. Yeah. And I think it's important. Like, think, oh, third shot. And you're going to have to do one a year. So what are they going to do? That's your fourth? That's your fifth? You're just No, it's a booster shot. Yeah, you it's a flu to, shot. It's like, like, just... a flu shot. It's a, the way that they're talking about it in the media right now is really bothering me. Yeah. Because mm. yep. people don't want to hear about how the number of shots, by talking about three shots, people are going to be like, oh, I got to get three needles poked in me. Like, it's going to make hesitancy even yep. worse. And so... Yep. The way that they're talking about it is really, like, very sad. Yeah. Instead of explaining that this is how the human body works, and mm -hmm. also viruses mutate, and so it is likely that we will need an it's accurate a booster but... <laughs> yeah. next year. Yeah. Like it that. Be a and booster. everyone understands what a booster is. Like we've all gotten boosters as kids. Yeah. Hopefully. So. <laughs> should have. You so, should have gotten know. boosters as adults. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who are these people listening to? Not I mean, us, I will tell you, I know people who <laughs> came to me and told me things that they read on Facebook that were totally incorrect and they were they were not going to get the vaccine and I had to have several conversations with them and then they Good got job. the vaccine, but like it's it's tough because if you hear if you hear things from something you consider a trusted source. Yeah. You might not know, you might trust in them for a lot of things like brands of baby bottles and what um, park you're supposed to take your baby to and all these sor sorts of things, right? Um, oh, this baby food is really good. Like you could be in this mommy and me Facebook group that's really great information. And then if they put out there that if you're breastfeeding, if you take the vaccine, then it's gonna have implications on your child i understand is all i'm saying i understand how sometimes a trusted messenger can say something outside of their wheelhouse but somebody who's not used to being a skeptic about these sorts of things doesn't know to say well they don't know about that they were they were pretty right on about the sensitive skin diapers. So mm -hmm. I'm sure they understand exactly how viruses and vaccines work. It's, I mean, this is, <laughs> if you listen to a science podcast weekly, you're probably not thinking that way, yeah. but not everyone does that. So like for a lot of people, science was something they did in elementary and middle and high school. And that was it. So that's that's a big part of our job, right? Is to get people to understand that baseline science information so that they can be their own judge. But there yeah. are so many people out there who don't feel like, I, I think that's a lot of it too, right? They have their own imposter syndrome of not feeling like they can interpret the information themselves. So they depend on interpreters. And if their interpreter is not a, a trustworthy interpreter, then, then that leads to problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Stephen Wright. The only news I watch now is Twist. It just seems like other news outlets have political motives. So do we? I do at least. I'm completely <laughs> politically motivated. If if the science doesn't say something that I like, I oh no, that's not true. I say it anyway. Right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or you or it. you change your mind. We saw you actually change your position. <sighs> Isn't that a crazy thing? This week. Do you to, see that uh, anywhere in, in, in the, else in the <laughs> world that people will like, I, I do don't all believe the that at all. Here's some evidence. Wow, I completely believe that now. Yeah, I was wrong. It, hey. It's a good exercise. Okay. You should. Everyone should go out and find something they don't believe and uh, change their mind about it. The self-driving really nice. car. I completely changed my mind on that. So. I've always been for that. There you I've go. I've always been mm -hmm. for that. I, I was want very to, again it. I wanted to take a nap on my way to work. That would yeah. be perfect. <laughs> I was not with it. All right, drive me, drive me, and then set an alarm for 15 minutes after you've parked. <laughs> <All right. laughs>
<laughs> I don't want to be late, but I don't want to be too early. Yeah, there is no COVID shot for animals. But perhaps there will be because oh. these vaccines work for humans. So I'm sure we're going to be vaccinating animals with similar uh, formulations because we do know that other animals get it. And I, it I would thought... affect, uh, yeah. affect agriculture, farming, right? So the so the, the San Diego Zoo chimps did get the COVID vaccine. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. So, Ahead um, of a lot of humans, too, which yeah. is also... Hmm. Yeah, that was a whole thing, but you know, ultimately, depending on their exhibit type and the fact that they are in common space with other hominids <laughs> on a daily basis, yeah, every day. they potentially are in a high risk category. So <laughs> they're also an endangered species. So I, it would be great not to lose them to COVID. Um, Keep- but yes, they uh, they got the vaccine. Keep it going in the chat room. I don't believe in Scientology. Should I reassess? I think so. I think you should reassess. Uh, maybe there's another reason that you should not believe in it that you hadn't thought of the first time around. Maybe you'll find more <laughs> problems if you look into more. it a little bit. That's right. More research. Yeah. We'll do more research. More research may just confirm. And if it doesn't, then, you know, that's a path you could potentially walk down, I suppose, in some level of reality that fully address yeah should we go Have yeah. we done I could, it? i'm gonna go make breakfast so yeah go anybody, ahead, wants, anybody who wants uh, uh frittatas uh come on over i like frittatas it's gonna be a Might big be frittata a morning frittatas and yeah that sounds delicious <sighs> yeah let's go to bed everyone or get up and do your day where are it's sleep time, it's wake time, it's middle of the day time, depending on where you are. So lucky to be joined by people all over the place. Yeah. What is it you're supposed to, what, what are we supposed to say right now? Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night. Say good, say good morning, Justin. Morning, Justin. <laughs> good, good night, Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again, and we will see you once again next week. Have a good week.